I had for my wife, Ruby. She committed me, before she passed, to get this job done. And it's that power of love that continued to move us forward during the most difficult and isolated and challenging times of this struggle. Even today, AB60, authored by then Assemblyman Luis Alejo in 2013, has its critics. Some say it rewards undocumented residents with privileges they don't deserve. But others call it an effective safety measure. Supporters point to the fact that licenses do require passing driving tests to ensure people know the rules of the road. Having licenses might also discourage drivers afraid of being deported from fleeing accident scenes. A Stanford University study seems to back that claim, finding there were 4,000 fewer hit-and-run crashes in the law's first year. There's lessons to be learned, and we will continue to win with DACA, immigration reform, dignity, and rights for all working men and women. Mil gracias. At City Hall, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The councilman's late wife, Ruby Cedillo, died of breast cancer in 2002. Denim Day is known as the day people wear jeans to work, but it's got a deeper meaning. It's a stand against sexual violence and all forms of sexual harassment. Anna Marcos takes us to the rally. Rape culture ends and it all ends today. I don't need to say no because I never said yes. A spirited rally on this Denim Day the sexual violence prevention campaign has added meaning this year as it joins the Me Too movement with a strong message, sexual harassment not on my watch, and a mission to end rape culture now. The voices of the victims span all races and cultures. As early as three years old, I think that's as far as I can remember, I remember being sexually abused. I remember my stepfather coming into my room at night fondling me, touching me. I remember him making me wash up and shower because I needed to smell good for him. For a long time, our society has normalized the rape culture. The story goes, the man is my cousin-in-law, and I am six years old. His penis is a strange creature in his hands. It made me think that I was unworthy, that I was inadequate, that I was tainted, that I was undeserving of love, that I was unlovable, and I actually believed that it was my fault. What must be wrong with me that from an early age that I had to endure this? City leaders also taking a stand, declaring City Hall a harassment-free zone. They are working to make harassment and sexual assaults easier to report in the City Hall workplace. I want to say to the men as well, this is your issue too. This is not a women's issue, this is a human issue. Your silence is complicity in this situation, and it needs to end now. If you see it, you must report it. Time's up, men, and it's been up for a long time. But the stories of sexual violence don't just end on the steps of City Hall. They're everywhere, including out here on the streets. City leaders say 91% of women who end up on the street have been victims of physical or sexual violence. I've been living outside for 27 years, and uh, ever since I got here, I'm being harassed and everything. But for those marking this day, wearing jeans and speaking out just might start to turn things around. The story goes, every woman has a story. I matter, and if I can use my voice to make it so this doesn't happen to another person, then so be it. From big to small, to smaller yet, the change has begun. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. LA Metro officials also joined the rally, declaring the Metro Transit system a harassment-free zone as well. well. May is the month dedicated to paying tribute to the generations of Jewish Americans who have helped form the fabric of American history, culture, and society. Los Angeles has been home to large populations of the Jewish community. Rasha Goel has more. Yeah, now I'm at City Hall where officials kicked off Jewish Heritage Month, celebrating and recognizing Jewish history and culture. And here's an interesting fact if you didn't know, but Mayor Eric Garcetti is the city's first elected Jewish mayor. <laughs> 
I'm the first elected Jewish mayor and very proud of that. But we, as was mentioned, we have so many firsts that were here uh, in Los Angeles. Our first Jew, J Jacob Frankfurt, arrived in 1841. Uh, Morris Goodman was the first Jewish city council member, and that was in 1850. Um, this was a town that didn't really care back then uh, about uh, whether you were Jewish or not, it opened itself up. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, about 40% of the population in Boyle Heights was Jewish. The core of the community was Brooklyn Avenue, since renamed Cesar Chavez Avenue, which hosted a string of Jewish-owned businesses, including the original Cantor's Deli. The 5th Council District is also proud of giving birth to Bet Sedek Legal Services on Fairfax Avenue, on being the first home in Los Angeles to many Holocaust survivors, as well as immigrants from the former Soviet Union and Iran, as well as the location of the Museum of Tolerance and the Simon Wiesenthal Center. The overwhelming story of Jews in LA is one of triumph. Whether it is the great storytelling culture brought from the old country that founded many of the major film studios that would ultimately shape global culture, or the love of scholarship that founded many of the great institutions here in Los Angeles. Council member Paul Krikorian talked about the similarities between the Armenian and Jewish communities. A common history of uh, an an two ancient peoples who um, were primarily a di diasporan peoples throughout their history, who longed for a free and independent homeland and kept that as a vision and a dream uh, that maintained us uh, united for over the course of centuries. Both of our communities found refuge here in Los Angeles. And a lot of folks, when you think about Jewish heritage, people get confused because, yes, it's a religion, Judaism is a religion, but it's also a culture, it's also uh, an ethnicity. An exhibit is on display for the month of May in City Hall, highlighting Jewish history and the contributions in Los Angeles. And it's so beautiful that the city has come to recognize that and have come together to celebrate the Jewish community and all of its accomplishments. Jewish Heritage Month recognizes the unique and colorful past of the community while celebrating the present and future. From City Hall, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Are you finally ready to move out of your apartment and buy that first house? Well, for a lot of people, this isn't easy. But free workshops sponsored by the city are helping to make the American dream of owning a home come true. Gil Reyes has more. You get a copy of your credit report. Like these other renters intently listening, Terry Bistline says she's finally doing it. She's finally buying a house. Because the rents are exorbitant today, and it makes sense to invest in your own home than to pay somebody else. This seminar, hosted by the group called New Economics for Women, showed people how to buy that first home, offering tips on how to get a mortgage, building the necessary savings to secure loans, and avoiding predatory lenders. The workshop took place at Councilman Curran Price's district office in South Los Angeles. Many families believe that home ownership is out of their reach because they don't have the down payment or maybe they don't have the credit profile to be able to get a home loan. And so I would invite those individuals to attend one of our workshops so that they can learn more about the programs available to them. LA City also offers low income first time home buyers up to $60,000 in financial aid if they qualify. More free seminars are coming up. Log on to neweconomicsforwomen.org slash homebuyer to register. I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The LA Rams Cleats for Character program inspires young sports-minded kids from the inner city. And what bigger inspiration than former NFL player Jonathan Franklin? And Marcos brings us his inspiring story. Former NFL football player Jonathan Franklin was once an inspiration out in the field, but even off the field, he is still inspiring his community in South L.A. to dream big and become something. The former UCLA guard and running back got drafted into the NFL, where he played with the Green Bay Packers. So essentially, Jonathan Franklin grew up in South Central L.A. and went to Dorsey High School. Against all odds, he got to play in the big time. Then a severe spinal injury sidelined Franklin, but he wasn't done with football. He now works for the L.A. Rams, giving back to the community by inspiring kids like this team of young varsity football players at Locke High School in South L.A. 
teaching them that while football may be their life, there is also life after football. I want you to know your worth goes beyond just the game of football. Franklin is giving out gear and shoes and some words of wisdom as part of the Rams' Cleats for Character program. The reason of that is to instill in the power of education, character, and goal setting within their lives to look beyond just the game of football and self-worth and who they are and confidence why they're playing this game. And in this empowerment session, the young men get to talk about their own dreams and goals. I just want to be successful so that my, uh, my younger siblings could always um, have some fall back on. It's, it's a blessing to actually have people who've been to where I want to get to actually come and talk to us about how their life is going and the stuff that they've been through to get to where I want to be in the future. I think it's amazing that the Rams are looking at Lock High School because it's, it's like a ghetto school, but it's good that they're looking at us. You know, we, uh, inner city school, kind of underlooked, so they just want to show some support. That support comes with hope, hope that even a kid from an inner city school in South LA can dream big and make it big, and still be making it big, even after his goals have changed. I'm Anna Margos for LA This Week. The Rams Cleats for Character program visits schools throughout the LAUSD system. Metro officials promote worker safety. The city celebrates Cinco de Mayo and a dangerous intersection in North Hollywood just got a lot safer. All these stories in City B. In commemoration of National Safety Week in the city, Metro officials called on construction workers and contractors to always be mindful of their safety as they perform various infrastructure projects in the region. Metro's Purple Line Extension Project, Crenshaw LAX Transit Corridor, and the Regional Connector, among other projects. We're highlighting making safe choices, thinking before you act, and act in a safe way. The Latino community came out to celebrate Cinco de Mayo in the city. One celebration took place at the Los Angeles Historic State Park in downtown LA, featuring traditional live music and food, along with dozens of other vendors. Cinco de Mayo is an annual celebration held on May 5th. The date is observed to commemorate the Mexican Army's unlikely victory over the French Empire at the Battle of Puebla on May 5th, 1862. I feel that we should all get together and um, celebrate Cinco de Mayo and be proud of our heritage. City Council Member Paul Krikorian activated a new traffic signal at Whitsett Avenue and Vaux Street in North Hollywood, an intersection often used by neighborhood kids to access the city's Whitsett soccer complex. The new signal is the result of funds Council Member Krikorian secured to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety in the San Fernando Valley. When you have a street with 17,000 cars a day, many of which are speeding and distracted, that creates a great danger for those kids who are trying to come to those parts. We, it, it's our responsibility to eliminate that danger and make sure that they can utilize their park and you enjoy their neighborhood in a safe way. It's a day to create an impact for generations to come while building a sustainable environment today. Rasha Goel has more on how Angelinos came together to help beautify their city on a tradition that's over a hundred years old. With shovels in hand, volunteers of all ages were ready to get their hands dirty as they planted new trees in celebration of Arbor Day. Arbor Day is an annual observance that celebrates the role of trees in our lives and promotes tree planting and care. All of you are here making a difference for future generations. A lot of people talk about community beautification. You're here today making it happen. A lot of people talk about fighting against climate change. You're here today making it happen. A lot of people talk about biodiversity. You're here making that happen. 400 volunteers came out to plant 173 new trees in the North Hollywood area as part of a beautification project. The project will transform a concreted corridor into a greenway potted with drought-resilient street trees. 
They help save energy, they help save you know, money, they help save all kinds of things just by planting a tree in your neighborhood and taking care of it. It's something really easy that you can do that's great for your home value, it's great for the environment. The planting is on a 1.6 mile stretch of Vinland Avenue between Oxnard Avenue and Strathern Street. We have all kinds of trees, lemon, um, lime trees, and we just want to make the city more beautiful. Beautiful and sustainable for years to come. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. As a formal holiday, Arbor Day was first observed in 1872, but tree planting festivals are as old as civilization. The tree has appeared throughout history and literature as the symbol of life. Well, here's your chance to spay or neuter your cat at no charge, come out for a senior citizen fair, and enjoy free harbor boat tours at the Port of LA. All this in this week's Things to Do. If you own a cat or a kitten, here's your chance to get them spayed or neutered for free. Throughout the month of May, LA Animal Services will be offering free cat spay neuter certificates to all LA City residents, regardless of income levels. By taking advantage of free certificates for cats and kittens, the community will help stem the tide of pet overpopulation that LA Animal Services faces daily in each of the six service centers. By spaying or neutering your cat or kitten, you are helping LA Animal Services get one step closer to ending the Los Angeles community's pet overpopulation and help LA Animal Services place more animals in permanent homes. To apply and receive a free certificate the same day, the public is encouraged to visit their nearest LA City Animal Services Center. LA City residents can now also apply for a free certificate online at laspayneuter.com. If you're a senior, don't miss the 10th Annual Senior Symposium and Job Fair. Spend the day visiting a variety of vendors and service providers. Take advantage of the many health screenings offered at no cost. Win a raffle prize donated by vendors in attendance. Listen to guest speakers and presentations and get help in resume building. Meet agencies looking to hire, assist older adults or caregivers, or search for part-time or full-time opportunities. Call 818-705-2345 to RSVP. Free lunch and continental breakfast to those who RSVP. The Senior Fair takes place Saturday, May 19th from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. at the One Generation Senior Enrichment Center located at 18255 Victory Boulevard in Reseda. As part of World Trade Week, the Port of Los Angeles will host free harbor boat tours. The public tours are one hour and will depart every 30 minutes from both Banning's Landing Community Center in Wilmington and the Los Angeles Maritime Museum in San Pedro. For more than 90 years, World Trade Week, an initiative of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, has been the nation's most extensive and unique program of its kind, dedicated to educating the public about the importance and benefits of global trade to the local and U.S. economy. Related events and programs are held throughout Southern California every year in May, coinciding with World Trade Month. The public boat tours take place on Saturday, May 19th from 10.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. For more, visit portoflosangeles.org. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kane from all of us here at LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.
Excellent. Cut, print, we're moving on. Hi, I'm Shane Woodson on the set of Cain and Abel here in Hollywood. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35. Our city, our channel. Okay, I need my actors back on set, back in position.
Good morning, good morning. I want, today is Friday, May 18th. Shh. If you could please take a seat. Please take your seats. Anyway, good morning. It is May 18th, Friday. I want to welcome you to City Hall. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. The public is, is welcome. Mr. Clerk, we do have a quorum. Would you please call the roll? Blumenfield, Bonabuscano, Cedillo, Angler, Harris, Sasson, Wieser, Koretzka, Corey, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Rue, Wesson. Ten members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you very much. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. O'Farro moves, Kokorian seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Bonin moves and Mr. Buscaino seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, the Department of Building and Safety recommends that Council continue items 1A through 1C, which is the entirety of item 1, to June 19. Okay, so, so ordered. Continue. Very good, sir. That brings us to item two. It's an item notice for public hearing. It is recommended that council, after receiving public comment, close the public hearing and continue its consideration of the Budget and Finance Committee report relative to the mayor's proposed 2018-19 budget for the city to a special council meeting on Monday, May 21st at 9 a.m. Okay, uh, that's exactly what we'll do. Mr. President, we do have cards on this matter. All right. Continue. Items 3 through 10 are items which public hearings have been held. Committee reports for items 3, 6, and 7 have been posted and circulated and are now before Council for consideration. Okay, so let's bring those up for a vote. Uh, let's open the roll. Three, three. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Okay, continue. And Mr. President, uh, Ms. M Mr. Cedillo has actually just walked in. If we could reconsider uh, items three and four, the two ordinances, and then uh, vote again, we would have 12 for those. Okay, guys. let's do let that. So the first vote is on reconsideration. Yes. Please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Now let's actually vote on the items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, that brings us where, Mr. Clerk? Mr. President, items 11 through 13 are items whose public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Cards on all three items, sir. Let's hold those and move forward. Very good, sir. Uh, it's a bit too early for the special meeting, so that would take council uh, back to items called special or general, or excuse me, uh, general public comment or presentations. All right, uh, let me look for Mr. O'Farrell. Would you be, why don't we kick things off with a Mr. O'Farrell presentation? Uh, Mitch, the floor is yours. Yeah, come. Yeah, over here. You come over here. You're right here. Yeah, come. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, with all these beautiful young faces that you see in the chambers today, there is a, a very, very tragic and sad backdrop that we're all dealing with this morning because there was yet another mass shooting at a high school in the United States, this time at Santa Fe, Texas, where we know of at least eight young students who lost their lives today because of a mass shooting with an assault weapon. It is in this backdrop that in Los Angeles today we celebrate youth and accomplishments and hope for the future. And all of the potential of young people. And I just had to mention that because it is more important than ever that as a society, as a civilization, that we highlight the incredible works of our youth while at the same time fighting to the end for gun safety across the United States so that our young people do not have to live in fear or with the stress 
that some crazed person could come into any school and start shooting. I don't want to belabor that, colleagues, but it has to be mentioned. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. President and colleagues, for giving me the privilege today in this council chambers on this morning and let you know that it is such an honor for me personally and professionally to stand here today with the incredible youth at Belmont High School in the 13th District. I stand here today surrounded by the boys and girls cross-country teams from Belmont High, led by Coach Roman Gomez and this talented team of boys cross-country competitors who won their second consecutive Division III city championship. And for that, they deserve a huge round of applause. It's worth noting that this is the boys' 21st city title since 1982. In all, Belmont has won over 50 LAUSD city titles when you add the girls, the JV, and the freshman, sophomore team titles. Let's give them run, one more round of applause. That's phenomenal, <laughs> young people. That's unbelievable. Uh, Mr. O'Farrell, I know you're proud. Unbelievable. Now, it, it's about to get even more interesting here. The girls' cross-country team won the city award for having the highest grade point average in this city. Check this out. Their combined GPA of the young ladies standing with me today is 3.8. 3.8. Boys, do you consider that a challenge? Yeah, are you going yeah. to are you gonna get to 3.8? All right. All right. 4.1. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Belmont Cross Country has graduated 100% of its athletes for the last five years. 100%. During the same time, 95% of Belmont High School graduates have been accepted to two- and four-year colleges. This accomplishment is even more impressive considering a few of the dynamic team members were new to this country. Here's a quote from Coach Gomez. I feel really proud of the kids, especially because I can identify with their hardship coming to this country. I myself came here as a teen, and it was a challenge with a language acquisition, but I tell the students to trust in their talents and continue to be hardworking individuals. Belmont High School is also among the schools with the highest number of unaccompanied minors from Central America. I would like to welcome, first of all, Lester Solis, ninth grade, to share a few words. Lester. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Los Angeles City Council. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am a Belmont athlete, and my name is Lester Solis, and it is my first year there and I am a freshman, <laughs> obviously. All right. What defines a Belmont cross-country runner? There are three things that define a Belmont cross-country runner. A Belmont cross-country runner must have heart, they must have dedication, and they must also have good sportsmanship. Heart. The definition of heart for a Belmont cross-country runner means is to be able to work out hard throughout the season. Yes, there's times where we train and it's hot or it's cold, but no matter what, we have that heart to be able to push through that, through, that, through that hard time, you know. And even though at times here in L.A. it gets hot like a desert, but us as Belmont runners, we are able to defeat that desert and be able to survive in it. <laughs> Next, a Belmont runner must be able to have the dedication to train. On the weekends, we wake up early in the morning, and then on the weekdays, we still have to go train after a long day of school. We still have to go to the park, train, and make sure that we do good. Lastly, a Belmont runner must have good sportsmanship. Yes, it's a sport. Yes, we all want to win. It's competitively, you know? But no matter what, at the end of the day, you always must, be able to, you must always have to be able to shake your hand of the opponent and say, you know what, you did good. But of course, us as Belmont, we'd rather win. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank you all for inviting us here. I'm very happy. I bet my teammates are, of course. And it's good to be in your presence here. And most importantly, um, I feel very blessed to be with my teammates, my coach, 
and being here with you guys. And yeah, I mean, thank you very much. Have a good day, and bless you all. Same to you. Mr. O'Farrell, I have a member on the, the queue. If let's, uh, there's, there's more. Go so ahead. And, and let's just hold off until, until then. Okay, so just give me a signal. All right. Um, how about a big round of applause for ninth grader Lester Solis? <laughs> a championship team can only have a champion as its coach, and that is Coach Roman Gomez. Here's a little background about Coach Gomez. Graduated from Belmont High School in 1985. Graduated from USC with a political science major in 1989 and went on to teach social studies at Belmont High School in the fall of 1989. He is now a resource specialist program teacher. In 2014, he returned to coach the cross country teams and in two years led the team to their first title since 2002. A few of his, accompl his accomplishments here. 27, 2018, LAUSD Cross Country Coach of the Year. 27, 2018, California Coaches Association Girls Cross Country Coach of the Year. And in those same years, finalist for Teacher of the Year. So here's a man who graduated from Belmont High School and returned and is spending his professional career in the neighborhood that nurtured him to become who he is. Here's another fun fact about Roman and his brother Manny, who coaches the girls' cross-country team at Lincoln High School. Both led their teams to a championship on the same day. The Belmont cross-country team, or tradition rather, is going strong thanks to the Gomez brothers. Colleagues, I introduce to you Coach Roman Gomez. Thank you for having us. Good morning. Um, I first want to thank our staffers for CD13, uh, William Ayala, Juan Fregoso, and Hector uh, Vega, as well as Council Member um, Mitch O'Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, Council President Herb Weston, for having us. Um, this brings me back a lot of memories because when I was a student at, at SC, I worked as an intern for Richard Alatorre. And... Um, who just celebrated a birthday a couple days awesome ago. Awesome guy. And um, late president, uh, John Ferraro, wrote the letter of recommendation, and that's how I was able to get into USC. Awesome guy. Uh, wow. I just want to say that uh, my heart is with the students and their families of the students in, in Santa Fe, Texas. I, I want to, you know, our prayers are with, with those families. Again, thank you all for having us. I, I am so proud of these kids. They're working hard. I'm, I'm really proud. I, I, I couldn't say enough about their character, their commitment to their community, and, and, and I'm just so proud of them. So I want to really thank you for having us here. And uh, we're going to do a, a, a cheer just because we do this at the beginning of every race and at the end of, the, uh, of every race. Okay, so we're just going to do a quick one. Belmont on three. Put your hands in the middle. One, two, three. Belmont! Thank you. Okay, I, I, I want to recognize Mr. Sadio. Mr. O'Farrell, let me uh, congratulate you and thank you for bringing these young uh, men and women to, uh, to the chambers. I want to congratulate them. Uh, my father, this young man here, went to Belmont. And he, uh, he, he, when he came to Los Angeles in 1941, he enrolled at the junior high school, and then at Belmont, and then left to be uh, a paratrooper. Uh, the history, though, Mr. Gomez, is of running at uh, with the, uh, Belmont is an incredible history, uh, and there are Olympians who have come. I have a friend, you may remember him, Teferi Grabe, Ethiopian. Uh, you know him, uh, Mr. Weston, from the AFL-CIO? Uh, oh, Yeah. Yeah, from Orange County. He is now in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is a leader in the labor movement. But uh, before that, he was uh, a runner. I, I think he had the city championship. He won a city championship. Yeah, he won a city championship. And so I live uh, down the street, about a block away from the school, 
in the first district. It's right at the border uh, across from the Roy Ball Learning Center. And so I just want to say congratulations. Of course, uh, all of them graduate. Of course, all of you will go on to college. Of course, all of you will be successful because you've already demonstrated the discipline necessary to be a leader and to be successful in life. And that is all those miles you put in, all the team discipline, all the sacrifices, everything that you do uh, to be a champion is what's going to make you a champion in life. And so I just want to applaud all of you. It's the same experience we have with Students Run LA. Uh, when people run, uh, they just get this incredible discipline, uh, self-respect, pride, and from that you become uh, successes in life. So congratulations to all of you and your families. God bless you. Let's give them a round of applause. Back to you, Mr. O'Farrell. So, uh, colleagues, uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, we want to present this certificate of recognition for a championship year for the boys and girls of Belmont High uh, for this incredible accomplishment with their championships and their incredibly high grade point average on, on the girls' team. Uh, it's a championship year for a championship team. Go Sentinels! We would like to present uh, Mitch O'Farrell with a Belmont uh, jersey. Right. I know All he's going right. to use it when I he goes know. out running from now on. <laughs> That's right. There you go, that. Mr. O'Farrell. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Belmont Thank High you. School. Congratulations, Mitch. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So as they're exiting, I want to recognize Mr. Blumenfield for our next presentation. I will wear this proud. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. First, we're going to bring the girls up. We've got two presentations. Colleagues, we've got some hunters in the house today. Are there hunters in the house? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Mr. Koretz, I'm just talking about the school mascot. No, no, no trouble there. Uh, <laughs> so please welcome the Canoga Park High School girls cross-country team. They were the 2017 Los Angeles City Section 2, D Division 2 champions. Let's give the champs yeah. a round of applause. It's this champion day. Now, even more amazing, the girls' country cross-country team is composed of athletes who mostly had never competed before in the sport. For most of them, the cross-country team is the first sport that they ever joined. The, that, these athletes usually come to the coaches unaware of the time commitment and unaware of the fact that cross country is one of the toughest sports to compete in. The practices, as, as I've been told, are not only difficult, but are they a real, tent, a real test of endurance and inner strength. Now, the girls on the team mostly come from households of lower income. Canoga Park, for those of you who don't know, is in the flat expanse of the San Fernando Valley. It's not known for having hills to practice on. Therefore, many of these young women have to travel to destinations where they can get this challenging practice run. And Coach Vasquez has said that one of the many challenges that these girls face is that sometimes their families have issues with girls playing sports. Some of the parents see sports as activities for boys and are often unfamiliar with the benefits of school athletics. And, some, and another challenge is parental involvement has been low because the parents work in jobs that don't have the flexibility for parents to leave in the middle of the day to go support their, their children. But these coaches have spent time educating and working with the parents and turning that around. 
to the benefit of participating in school ath athletics, teaching them that the skills uh, about running, that, that the skills that are developed, it develops discipline, time management, camaraderie, respect, appreciation, and pride in their school. The results, well, the results are what we're seeing here. They have paid off. These girls are not only excelling on the course, but they're also excelling in the classroom, which is equally amazing. In the past three years, all of the graduating girls have been uh, accepted and attended college, except for one who went to the Army. So they've all been incredibly successful. And despite the obstacles they faced, in 2015, the Canoga Park girls uh, cross-country team won their first title. Two years later, here we are, this amazing title. Now, before I present the certificate, I want to introduce their coach, Gonzalo Vasquez, to say a few words. Welcome, coach. Welcome. Uh, thank you, council members. Congratulations, congratulations to my girls' uh, cross-country team. Um, one of the coaches, Coach Vasquez, my other coach, Coach Mohamed Haddad, uh, our girls' cross-country team made history in 2015 when they became the first women's team in Canoga Park's 102-year history to win a girls' sport. In 2017, they followed that with a second championship. Most of these athletes have never participated in organized running, and in many cases, joining the cross-country team was the first team that they ever joined. Distance running, uh, anybody will tell you, is by far the hardest sport. It requires much discipline, dedication, and a little something that I call guts. In every race, you're competing against a cruelest competitor, and that's yourself. No matter how fast you go, there's still room for improvement and doing better, setting a new personal goal. You have to be a little crazy to do this sport. We've had to be inventive about our workouts. We don't have hills, as the councilman uh, earlier said. It can get up to 115 degrees in the valley. We have stretches of more than 10 days with temperatures over 100 degrees. That means that we can't work out during the day. We also have to, do, we also, uh, have to go and invade our local neighborhoods. Uh, none of our athletes drive, so that means the transportation is a challenge. This track season, we had to train at 5.45 in the morning from January to April. As a result, you get individuals that are highly organized, who know how to prioritize. Our cross-country team has the highest GPA of all sports in the school. Every graduating, senior, every graduating senior will attend college. Making the honor roll is expected. The question is not, are you going to college, but where are you going to college? We, the coaches, we expect a lot from them academically, and they have delivered in the classroom, as well as in the race course. They inspire us. You inspire us, the coaches. Coaching is one of the best part of my days. It's one of, one, one of the best part of Coach Muhammad's day. We are as happy as you are about your success, and perhaps even more. We look forward to your continued success in college and in your future professional careers. You are the future, and the future looks bright. Thank you for trusting us and allowing us to be part of your lives. Again, we thank the council for recognizing the girls' effort. Their success is a reflection of their work, commitment, and responsible behavior. It makes me very happy that you've taken the time to acknowledge them. They, cherish, they will cherish this experience for life. Now I'd like to bring my captain uh, to say a few words also. Welcome, Madam Captain. Good morning. Hello. My name is Catherine, and I am the captain for these wonderful girls. These girls and I woke up for practice before the sun did, and we left practice to go home after the sun set. Our parents, of course, worried of our well-being, but our dedication for this sport is far stronger than anyone could ever imagine. The hard work we put into this sport and to each other is worth the while when we feel the satisfaction of victory. These girls came ready to practice and run their hearts out because that's what running is all about. Whoever has the biggest heart. And I can promise you, every single girl behind me has the biggest heart. And they have the biggest heart in whatever they do, whether it be running or their education. That dedication they have grows even stronger with the sport like cross country. And it follows them wherever they may go in life. And yes, we did win city championship but we also won the ideologies of a successful life. Thank you. Congratulations, take a photo.
Let's give them one more round of applause. Congratulations, Canoga Park. Now, Mr. President, I, when I, I said we have hunters in the house, I used the plural on purpose because we not only have the cross-country champions, but I'd also like to welcome, and come on up, guys, the Canoga Park High School boys basketball team, the 2018 Los Angeles City Section Division Four champions. Come on, guys. All right. Championship day in it, City Hall. It is. You can feel it in the air, the championship. This incredible achievement was a long time coming. These amazing young men brought the Canoga Park Hunters the first boys basketball championship in their 104-year history. What? That's right. I said 104 years. Not that anyone here is that old, but the school itself is that old, and this is the first championship uh, for the boys' basketball team, so it is truly amazing. Uh, the groundwork for this accomplishment, this 2017-2018 historic championship, began this summer. Uh, from the, day, the first day of off-season training, they were building a fire in their bellies. And when the season started, that fire was in their hearts. And one of the biggest parts of this championship was the school's administrators. Principal Robert Garcia, Mr. Tony Ricalde, Ms. Kaylin Redmond, the athletic director, Lori Giacopuzzi. Together, they kept the team grounded and focused on this achievement. From the classroom to the court, these administrators care about the well-being of each of their students. And they know and they teach that the sport of basketball is about playing the right way. It's about showing kids that a great team, when you're a great team, you're successful by having each other's backs and working together toward a common goal and striving to make something happen. Now, this season was also special for another reason, because the community really came out for the team. Canoga Park community was engaged, and they are still buzzing with this success. Everyone wanted to be part of it. You could feel the energy in Canoga Park. The team wanted it for each other, they wanted it for the school, but they also wanted it for their community. And they brought pride to that community. Their goal was to win a city title, but to keep their team philosophy on the right track and bring everyone together in the school and the greater community. And they did deliver in an incredible fashion with a thrilling overtime victory over the Bravo Medical Magnet. Jose, sorry about that. The Bravo Medical Magnet in Boyle Heights, yes, that's who they beat for this championship. Now, uh, before I give them, Jose didn't even blink on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, before I, I bring a certificate up, I want to I bring the coach up, David Wilson, to say a few words. Right, David. First off, I'd like to say thank you for having us. This is a great experience for our kids at Kenoa Park High School. I think one of the big things that people miss sight of now these days is in some form, in some way, we're all product of the public high school system. And I think that's been lost. One of the things I love about our administrators at Canoga, they really care about our kids. We really focus on the character of our kids. No matter where we go, that's the forefront. Today, we're building stronger, more efficient, more vibrant students than ever before. Their means are much greater than ours. But even though they have everything, they still need fuel. We are the fuel that gives them the temperament to get up every day, to go to school and thrive. That is my job. That is my position. And I'd like to bring up my captain real quick, Jake Gomez, to speak a little words if possible. Good morning. My name is Jake Gomez. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Basketball play. Got to have it up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, first off, I want to say thank you, Mr. President, for having us and City Councilman. Um, it is uh, beyond a pleasure to be here. And uh, let me get started here. I'd like to start off with uh, reading a quote by Coach Wilson he made in 2006 when he first got the job here at Canoga. The goal is to win a championship, and to reach that goal, you have to build your philosophy from the ground up with every colleague, player, and coaches on staff, as well as every fan that comes on staff or for every fan that comes and see you perform, not play. And this doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen. This is our bio of our team. 
The groundwork for the 2017-2018 Historic Championship began in the summer, from the first day of off-season training, building that fire in our bellies. And when season starts, that fire will be in, in their hearts. One of the biggest parts of this championship was our school administrators, Principal Robert Garcia, Tony Ricaldi, and Ms. Kaylin Redman, and our athletic director, Lori Jacopuzzi, keeping us grounded and focused toward the achieving our goal. And they really care about our well-being and about our student athletes. The sport of basketball is about playing, or players playing the right way and showing kids that you can be a great team and still be successful by caring and loving each other. But what made, this, what made this season so special, Mr. President, is that this one, we did, it, we did it in front of our fans. The building of our new fan base was electric. The city of Canoga Park still has its buzz to it. And we wanted it for each other and for the city of Canoga Park. Winning a championship like this in your own city in some ways transcends the sport of high school basketball. Everyone wanted to be a part of it, and it's amazing. You can feel the energy. And our goal was to win a city title and try to keep our team philosophy on the right track and bring everyone together as one school and one community. Apparently we have. What a reward for the city of Canoga Park. The 104 year wait was over, but we're not done. Congratulations. And well said. Well said, man, well said. I'm so proud of each and every one of you. Well said. Let's give it up and give them the certificate. Here we go. Let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs> to the champs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wizar, as uh, Mr. Blumenfield's group is going to the back, you may want to move to the podium. Comes the rep of Boyle Heights. Yeah, join us, please. Yes, come on up. Congratulations. Congratulations. We all fit? We ready? Thank you very much and good morning everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome the Wilson High School Mules to Los Angeles City Council. And today we are honored to uh, provide our great Principal Martinez an opportunity to share with the teachers, the students, and the Wilson alumni a day in City Council to celebrate 80 years of Wilson High School history. Congratulations. Wilson High first opened its doors to the Al Sereno community in 1937. The original location was down on Eastern Avenue, where Al Sereno Middle School is located today. And I hear that the first classes took place in tents and bungalows. The first graduating class was about 40 students, and that doesn't nearly compare to the over 300 plus students that we see graduating today. In 1970, Woodrow Wilson High School moved its new campus to Multnomah on a hill. The new school was designed by renowned African-American architect Paul Williams. Wow. Workers had to excavate over a million cubic yards of soil to regrade the hilltop and use 3,500 tons of steels for the main buildings. The end result is a spectacular view of the city and Wilson becoming the first LUSD school to implement multi-floored buildings equipped with elevators and escalators to accommodate disabled students. The Woodrow Wilson High School of today is one that has not settled for anything other than being the absolute best it can be. Among other incredible educational achievements and programs, it graduates 90% of the senior class and reclassifies 24% of English language learners school-wide. 
Wilson sends 95% of its graduates to college, and it is a proud facet of the only K-12 international baccalaureate program feeder pattern along with Farmdale, Al Sereno Middle School in the Los Angeles Unified School District. So along with that, you know, a great school, you always see alumni that are involved. And for more than 80 years, people have cared enough about this community, about the school, to make sure that it continues on and grows stronger. That carries on from generation to generation. And I want to thank the Wilson High School Alumni Association for all they do for our school. There is no effort too big or small for them to get involved with, from a book and fund drive to support the school library to more recent efforts to lobby successfully for LUSD to renovate the multi-purpose room and give our students a quality multi-million dollar performance venue. They are there time and time again. We're talking about a group of individuals who collectively work as one all-star team who literally put in hundreds of hours of volunteer time to assist the school they love. And before I uh, present a resolution, uh, I'd like to invite Principal Gilbert Martinez to share a few words. Welcome. Mr. Principal, welcome. Let's give Mr. Martinez a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, as a new principal at Wilson High School, I'm extremely proud uh, of our students, our families, our staff, and all the wonderful work that they do on a daily basis. Uh, currently, our graduation rate is 91%, the highest that Wilson has ever seen. Well, that's, this, let me stop you. 91%. Let's give them a round. Wow. And aiming to go higher. So um, a lot, I'm very, very proud of our students the, and our families, and we work very, very hard on a daily basis to have them succeed. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Wizar, our Alumni Association, uh, Julio Torres, and our wonderful, wonderful students. Thank you. So on behalf of uh, the Los Angeles City Council, uh, we'd love to present this resolution to Woodrow Wilson High School in its 80th anniversary, and congratulations on all the successes. Congratulations. And there's more. We not only celebrate the academic achievements of Woodrow Wilson High School, but we also want to take this opportunity to congratulate this year's girls soccer team who won the 2018 CIF Southern California Division V City Championship. Congratulations, girls. All right, championship day continues. <laughs> And while students have been winning in the classroom, we see that Wilson also has a strong tradition of winning in the sports fields. During the 1970s, Wilson's football coach was a legendary Vic Kushaw. Did you ever play against him, Mr. Cedillo? Did you ever play against Vic Kushaw, uh, coach no, at Wilson? I, no, no. I, uh, Randy Garcia was the city player of the year before Kusha, as there was Rick Hollenbeck was all Northern League. Uh, so I'm a little bit older than, than, uh, than uh, Ronnie, but my brothers played with him, and uh, Robert Diaz was all league uh, in that backfield with, uh, with Kusha. They had an incredible, incredible team uh, with an extraordinary offense. So, there no, I was spared that uh, defeat. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Quarterback for Roosevelt High School at the time. So thank, thank you, you, Mr. Cedillo. And you would ha add to that. Coach Kusha led the Mighty Mules to a 39-game winning streak with his son, the nationally record-setting quarterback, Ron Kusha, under center, leading the team to win the city's 3A championship in 1975, 76, and 77. The Mules football team also won in 1978 and most recently in 1996. And the boys baseball team brought us a city championship in 2011. Those were some exciting times for Wilson and the El Sereno community. And today, we'd like to congratulate the Wilson High School 2018 soccer team for creating new history, for bringing home the first city soccer championship in, El in the school's history. The, te the team, as, as I mentioned, won the CIF Southern California Division V city championship by beating Aspire Olin High School in Huntington Park by the score of 3-2. to two. But it is a great story. 
let me tell you, the, school, the soccer team finished the season with a 9-10-2 record and showed their fellow students and opposing teams during the championship playoff run that a team with character, determination, and resiliency can achieve great things working together. And it's not about where you start, but where you finish. And the girls showed us that. So I'd also like to acknowledge and recognize our team members who include Krista Gonzalez, Angel Salazar, Esmeralda Guzman, Emily Nerio, Malea Haro, Lorena Garcia, Chelsea Contreras, Karen Lopez, Jacqueline Rodriguez, Cassandra Lopez, Lorena Villarreal, Anahi Garcia, Brenda Martinez, Sandra Resendiz, Diana Mendoza, Anahi Zul, Leslie Moreno, Blanca Hernandez, Destiny Alvarez Morales, who was selected to the LA City Section All City Division 5 team, and Zitele Hernando, who was selected to LA City Section All City Division 5 Player of the Year. So congratulations, girls. The soccer team was guided by assistant coach Juan Castaneda, assistant coach Jocelyn Castaneda Tapia, and led by third year head coach Antonio Romo. Let's give our coaches a big round of applause as well. Thank you so much. So Coach Robo will share a few words as well. Welcome, Coach. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Council Member Wissad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you, uh, Peter, from the Wilson Alumni Association. Thank you, City Council, for having us and honoring us. This is a huge, huge privilege for us to be here. Uh, I'm extremely proud of our Lady Mules. Uh, as Council Member mentioned, we are the first soccer team in Wilson High School history to win a city championship, so we're extremely proud of that. We are also uh, only the second soccer team in all of Northern League history to win a, a city title uh, after Franklin Boys Soccer did it in 1974, which means uh, they are also, we are also the first girls soccer team to win a city title in Northern League history, so let's give a round of applause for that. I have to... Um, also credit my, uh, my assistant coaches, uh, my JV uh, coach and, and assistant coach, Juan Castaneda, my assistant coach and goalkeeper coach, Jocelyn Castaneda, and my assistant coach, Ketia Jimenez, all of which are alumni from Wilson High School and then put in countless hours and energy into this program and, and building it, and we're looking forward to continuing to, to build it and uh, looking forward to repeat next year so we can be in front of you all to do this all over again in, in a much more grander fashion. Um, their hard work their commitment, their desire, their resiliency. I think all these things have been mentioned, but they really live that day to day. Uh, that was a process for us to uh, identify with and, like I said, start, start to apply it every day in practice. Uh, we put in many hours uh, from the technical training and tactical training to also their mental training. That's, where they, uh, that's, that's what helped us arrive to, to win the championship. So I'm extremely proud of these ladies. Um, thank you all, and, and now I'd like to invite uh, one of our captains. We have three captains. I'd like to invite one of them up to, um, to share some words. Chelsea Contreras, senior captain. Let's give a round of applause. Good mor Hello, good morning. My name is Chelsea, and I would like to speak on behalf of my team. I would like to thank all of you for bringing us here to celebrate the history that has been made since this championship. Winning this championship for all of us has proved to many people that it's possible to accomplish anything and everything you put your mind to. I would also like to thank the coaches, volunteers, parents, the community, and the principal of Wilson High School. They have shown all of us that hard work and dedication can accomplish something big, and that's exactly what we did. I'm proud of each and every one of these girls. Without them, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you so much, and congratulations. And so to Peter Cabrera as well the, from the Alumni Association, thank you, Peter, for all the work you do and the hours you put in. You are constantly at the school, and a strong school is as strong as its alumni base and that they continue to give back. So thank you so much. And on behalf of the City of Los Angeles, I'd love to present this resolution to the Woodrow Wilson High School girls soccer team on the first ever championship. May we see many, many more. Congratulations.
Thank you, Mr. Wezar, and congratulations to Wilson High School. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, we're going to move on to item number two. Mr. Gregorian, are you ready for item number two, sir? Go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, members, today is the day that um, we will be hearing public comment on the city's budget for fiscal year 2018-2019. Um, as you will recall, uh, the day is limited to hearing public comment and we'll begin debate on the budget beginning Monday. So um, I just want to start off by giving you a brief overview of the work of the Budget and Finance Committee and um, the report that will be before you. Um, first of all, we've concluded, um, the Budget Committee concluded two weeks of budget hearings totaling 33 hours of work. We considered and reviewed the budgets of 44 different city departments, bureaus, and agencies. We received more than 100 public comments and, in fact, took public comment each and every day of the budget uh, hearings. Um, we asked for, as a committee, and reviewed more than uh, 160 budget-related memos and reports, all of which, for the first time ever, came in on time. So I very much appreciate the work of uh, staff in, in getting that done. This is a budget um, that is approaching $10 billion. Um, we have a general fund budget of $6.2 billion uh, and special funds totaling $3.7 billion. The reserve fund uh, that's before you is over $350 million, or uh, five, a little over 5.6% of the general fund. Again, maintaining our discipline in uh, uh, holding funds available for inevitable downturns in the economy so that we don't go through the same challenges that we've had in the past. Um, in addition, the mayor and the committee uh, increased the size of our reserve uh, of our budget stabilization fund as well. Uh, this is a budget that um, devotes $430 million uh, in homelessness services. Uh, this is a two and a half, this is two and a half times what we spent last year. Uh, that, of course, includes the mayor's proposal to devote $20 million for uh, shelter crisis and bridge housing and $10 million more that the Budget and Finance Committee added for uh, homeless services as well. We're uh, proposing to spend $41 million in sidewalk repair, a $10 million increase over last year, maintaining the size of the police department. Uh, at attrition of over 10,000 uh, sworn officers, uh, and in addition, significantly increasing uh, civilian hiring within the police department to free up more police time uh, for patrol and other uh, safety-related services. This budget includes hiring of 200 new firefighters and other increases in uh, spending by the fire department. We've set aside $89 million for liability claims, an increase over the past we hope that that will be a more reasonable number than we've budgeted in the past, but that is one of the uh, question marks that this budget contains that we'll have to be monitoring closely. Um, the budget includes two mil a two million dollar increase in the uh, unappropriated balance for citywide tree maintenance. Um, we've increased the number of animal control officers. We've increased the number of park caretakers. We added staff to reduce 311 response times. Um, and there's a number of other uh, increases to services that are finally paying some of the service dividends that comes from our improving economy and improving uh, financial health of this city. But I also, before we bring up um, uh, the public to talk about this, I also want to remind members that Things are better than they were, to be sure. Um, we're significantly healthier in this city than we were six years ago or eight years ago. But there are plenty of challenges still ahead of us. Among them are the almost inevitability that there will be, at some point, a downturn in the national economy, a recession that will lead to a reduction in the revenue streams that we have in the city that are so economically sensitive. Um, we have to continue to be concerned about the city's uh, uh, liability claims, uh, which 
don't seem to be trending downward yet. We're still working on trying to have more robust risk management, bring those numbers down, but we're still faced with the challenges of, of judgments against the city. Um, there are uh, increasing workforce costs, including the um, fact that we have our collective bargaining agreements up for renewal this year and the increased and continuing pressure that our pension funds place on the general fund as well. And there's the continuing challenge of meeting the cost of police overtime. So these are unquestionably challenges that we still will need to face. So I just urge all members to be cautious about being um, too confident in the fact that we have um, positive uh, trajectories because um, we have to be uh, prudent about those risks going forward in the future. So we're going to be inviting up in a moment the Neighborhood Council budget advocates to, to present on the budget. We'll be inviting members of the public up to speak in a moment. Uh, but I do want to just note that uh, I want to remind all members that Monday we'll begin debate on this budget. We will not be debating it today. But I want to urge you today, if you have any motions that you'd like to propose with regard to this budget, please complete them and submit them to the CLA today. Um, don't try to do it while we're in the middle of debate on Monday. I urge you, get it done today. Um, and it must be submitted, your proposals must be submitted to the CLA to put them into a proper budget motion format or else they won't be considered. Um, I'd also like to remind you that any motion that has a budgetary impact I will ask the Council President to refer to the Budget and Finance Committee. They will not be considered and voted upon on Monday. Um, those will go to committee for consideration uh, if they have a budgetary impact. So uh, please, remember again, members, get it done today, please. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite up the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates uh, to present on the budget. And this is a, a little bit of a departure from our usual practice members. Usually, since I've been budget chair, I've invited the Neighborhood Council budget advocates to have a seat at the table during budget and finance hearings, um, which they have every single year. Um, this year, unfortunately, in, in the course of juggling 44 different city departments and agencies, the schedule got a little bit jammed up and um, we weren't able to meet the scheduling needs of the budget advocates. Um, so we had to defer them until today. Uh, I thank them for being with us today and I thank them for the work that they do throughout the year in analyzing the budget and presenting the views of uh, 96 different neighborhoods around the city of Los Angeles. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the Neighborhood Council budget advocates. Thank you, Mr. Kikorian. Welcome, everyone. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, why don't we go around, Brian, you, starting with you, and we can introduce ourselves. Is there a microphone for you, sir? We can't hear you. Maybe you can share. I apologize for that. We do need to have you read. You go ahead. Right so it can be into the record. Your name again? I'm Brian Allen with Granada Hills North Neighborhood Council. Joanne Yvannick Garb, West Hills Neighborhood Council. Barbara Ringette, Silver Lake Neighborhood Council. Deidre Greenaway, Northridge East Neighborhood Council. Liz Amston, uh, Historic Highland Park. Jack Humphreyville, Greater Wilshire. Howard Katchen, Sherman Oaks Neighborhood Council. Carol Derby David with Park Mesa Heights Community Council. Um, I guess the first order, order of business is we'd like to thank uh, the Budget and Finance Committee for two things. One, allowing us to come here. And the second thing is for the 33 hours, if that's what it was, <laughs> of torture. I mean, of, of good, of good, <laughs> yeah, of lots of fun. Um, I also thought it was great that they are televised, so as opposed to schlepping downtown, we get to watch it, uh, you know, on our TVs. Um, a little bit about the budget advocates. Um, over the past year, uh, the budget advocates met twice every month. We also spent a, a considerable amount of time interviewing many, uh, many of the department heads throughout the city. We issued our preliminary white, white paper in November of uh, November of. Uh, of last year where we made 12 recommendations regarding the budget. 
Unfortunately, none of them were addressed, nor were the recommendations of the previous years addressed, including those including revenue-producing ideas. And speaking of revenue-producing ideas, Barbara, could you maybe go through some of the ones that you mentioned in the past or in today? Yes. Uh, last year, budget advocates presented 25 revenue-producing ideas to the Budget and Finance Committee. This year, we identified a number of additional ideas to produce revenue. A few of the ideas remain in progress, while none of the new ideas have been looked into that we know of. Jack Humphreyville and I are serving on the city's Revenue Generation Advisory Commission, meeting monthly beginning in March of this year, three months ago. We are exploring a number of ideas under headings of revenue expansion, revenue policy, financial transparency and efficiencies, fee development, and expenditure savings. The Commission is starting with three of the ideas. First, payment in lieu of taxes, known as the pilot program. The question for the city, are institutions paying for the city services they receive, such as sewer fees? Uh, the second, financial services transparency and evaluation. We're looking at bank fees, costs of investments, including pensions, that is, savings for the city. Third, tax expenditures and tax breaks review. It's a review, a cost-benefit analysis of past projects. We're hopeful that we can identify some good, large uh, revenue sources. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, could you read Jay's remarks, please? Thank you. To, to, yeah. Yeah. Just, just to clarify. These are the remarks of Jay Handel, who's our, our co-chairman along with Liz here. Um, he's unfortunately unable to be here. He's stuck back in Brooklyn visiting his grandchildren. He thought that might be a better use of his time. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. His comments are as follows. This has been a very difficult year for the budget advocates. The number of departments, a number of them never called us, including your own LAPD, the largest single share of our budget. In addition, when our mayor held his release of the budget, the budget advocates were not invited into our house to hear directly what the mayor had, had to propose. Then to top it off, the hardworking advocates arrived to present the budget and finance, but were held off until the afternoon, making it impossible for those attending to remain, as they have paying jobs and are not from the city, so, to cons so not considered the city family. All this is very disappointing, especially to those of us who have dedicated and spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours fulfilling our charter mandate to report on the budget and deliverables. We are tired of being asked to come to the table only to find out it is the do the dishes. We want to help plan the menu, not just do the dishes. We represent over 1,800 board members and 4 million stakeholders. Neighborhood councils will never have credibility if it doesn't begin right here and right now. Hear our voices, let us in. Open up the budget process in the beginning. Mandate departments to work with us, us, the advocates, in the beginning of the budget season. We ask your body and the mayor to open the doors to the mayor's budget team as well as the departments and allow us to sit in on the discussions as opposed to handling us budget already cooked and telling us just swallow it. It is time for the neighborhood councils that are, are respected and included. Thank you. President Wesson, members of the City Council, thank you for having us. In 2014, when I became a budget advocate, the Mayor called for priority outcomes to make Los Angeles the best-run big city in America by promoting good jobs for all Angelinos, creating a more livable, more sustainable city, and by partnering with residents and civic groups to build a greater city. Yes, as Councilmember Krikorian says, there are challenges, but how does this budget move us towards solutions? Where are the jobs? How is the city more livable? Where is the improved infrastructure and services? How are spiraling pension costs being contained? These are the points that need to be addressed to ensure a decent budget, points we don't see contained in the proposed budget to the extent we need them. And where is the transparency that would allow budget advocates and neighborhood councils to help the city find solutions? What happened to accountability? People don't want promises, we want outcomes. 
Economic resilience means a better budget and long-range planning, accountability, efficiency, not a tacit endorsement of departmental silos and not ba balancing the budget yearly on our children's futures. There have been four budgets since 2014 and we still have a deficit. We still lack services. We still need well-paying jobs for all and a livable city. For this, we need to see substance in the budget, not a shell game. At a time of record income to the city, we want to see real reserves, not cover-ups of unbudgeted but anticipated costs for labour, for pensions, for services, for infrastructure. We call on you to do, to do your duty and make sure this final budget is adjusted to put us back on track to be that greater city. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Deidre, would you like to talk a little bit about the homeless situation? Thank you for having us, Council. Um, I want to present um, the issues that I am concerned about regarding the homeless. Change is needed to improve outcome and out accountability for LASA and their management of Measure H funding for the homeless. Since they serve both Los Angeles City and Los Angeles County, it would be prudent to assess their capability to manage the increased funding levels resulting from Measure H. There are failing many service planning areas, particularly service planning area one, who have homeless families who have been waiting for needed services since November of 2017. They are in need of oversight and we need to make them accountable. Thank you. Brian, you had some comments? Thank you, Deidre. Thank you for receiving us. I started out last year at this table addressing an issue that was, in my, in my opinion, was very important to performing our duties. And that issue is that we are not, as, as budget advocates, we are not in the development stage of the, of the budgets. In order for us to do the jobs that we're being asked to do and provide the information that we are asked, uh, as an example, Ms. Uh, Councilman Kikorian asked us at the table last year, what departments do we suggest re removing? And we can't answer questions of that nature because we're not in on the development stage, so we don't know the details to the degree that we should know. As an example, we have four major departments all providing financial services, and there is no singular guidance to those. We should have a better financial uh, budget and financial operation that allows for someone to oversee that just as oversight is necessary to anything. I, I come from 40 years of being a CFO in, in, in accounting, and uh, proudly, I am also a graduate of Belmont High School. And we don't have the ability at this point to get to the basics. In ITA, they're trying to finish up the procurement system. Another $2 million on the third go-round. And if you look at that very closely, unless we're in the development stages and can see the details, there are very large numbers in the contractual services that are not identified. Okay, let me stop you for a minute, please. We, we're having challenges and challenges in listening. So if we keep it down, please, please, shh. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Go Thank right Thank you, ahead. Mr. Wesson. So it, it is imperative for us to do the job that we're chartered to do to get to the details. And we tried this year to contact the budget team, the mayor's budget team, and we were for all intents and purposes, rebuked. We would like to be embedded in that team. We would like to be able to see what is happening in the beginning, see the details, and be able to make comment on those items. Without that, I think our one to two hour per meeting with general managers or top people relies on our previous experience in business to bring forth legitimate and, and qualified opinions. 
On top of that, we know that the neighborhood councils are a 15 year, going on 16 years now, and they are in sore need of better training. We spend $4 million or attempt to spend $4 million a year, and I am not sure personally whether everyone on those teams know exactly what they're supposed to be doing and why. I go to a lot of meetings, a lot outside mine. I see what's going on, and I have a, a very strong opinion that, and the budget advocates in, in total agree that there has to be more training. The NCAs have to be trained better and engage and the members of the boards have to be trained better to know that they know their responsibilities, their authorities, and the procedures so that they can effectively perform their duties. With that, I think I've addressed enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. You know, Brian brought up the point that the transparency and the oversight, we budget advocates are essentially your citizens' oversight committee to the budget. And it's a, it is a responsibility that we all take very, very seriously. We work with the departments and we talk with the people and we find out what's going on, the nitty gritty of what's going on, not, a, not necessarily what you hear from the general managers. With that, um, a very simple revenue enhancement that I have suggested to several council members, and I have not seen any action on it, where you have the county and the city meeting, there is dumping from the county onto the city because there is only a $5,000 fine if they get caught dumping on the city's property. If they get caught dumping on the county's property, it's $10,000. So why not take a chance and do the $5,000? It's not that much. One of the things that you can do is either have parity with the fee, and that's what, a simple ordinance? That's not, it doesn't take very much, a motion and an ordinance. And it's a revenue generator for the city. My suggestion would be to increase it to $15,000 and let the county take their responsibility. But that's, my, that's mine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Uh, spoken a lot about the work of the budget advocates and indeed we do put in a lot of time and we are very very serious and committed to seeing that communities tax dollars are used efficiently and that the departments within the city of Los Angeles uh, strive to uh, work within their budget and the city as well uh, my contention is very simple, I suppose. Um, in, in life, it's often the small things that count. And to that, I think that the, the, the city likes to try on an ongoing base to, basis to try to find the, the golden geese that lay the golden eggs. Uh, my, uh, again, my, my contention is I think that the city needs to look more under the sofa cushions to see what exactly is available there. I mean, I can't tell you how many sofa cushions I've looked under and how many sparklets bottles I've filled up with coins. So there, there, there are definitely opportunities there to be pursued. And to that end, uh, such things as uh, bike licensing fees and at point of sale and thereafter on an annual basis and to impose requisite fines for noncompliance. Another issue uh, of which uh, for, for me it's uh, somewhat blasphemous and I might be drummed out of the core, but 
any given weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and during the week, there are um, real estate professionals who put out open house signs. And there are laws that uh, prohibit the posting of bills, signs, and other notices on public property. Uh, sorry? Oh, okay. Howard, just go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, that uh, there, uh, as I say, on public property, which realtors, of course, use to lure people into open houses as well as notify brokers of them. Uh, these laws really have not been enforced as far as the fines. The result is that on any given Sunday, Saturday, uh, sidewalk corners, street medians, and such are jammed with signs each weekend. Um, I would recommend that if unpermitted signs are posted, fines start at $100 and escalate to $500 on the third violation, at which point it becomes a misdemeanor. Uh, real estate professionals can post a sign on the property being showcased, but not at nearby intersections or streets, but must remove, uh, remove them at the conclusion of the open house. I mean, I'm sure you've seen open house signs that linger for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then just to conclude, I'd like to point out that within the city of Burbank and other cities throughout the United States, uh, there are open house permits required anywhere ranging from as little as $10 up to $25 per sign. And if you figure that that's done on an annual basis for the thousands upon thousands of signs that there are throughout Los Angeles, that could add up over time to be somewhat significant revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, I think you had some comments before I finish up. I have two concerns. One is uh, regarding the Ethics Commission. We are living in a time when the integrity of the electoral process at the national level is threatened. The city must assure transparency and the reliability of our local elections in order for our citizens to have confidence in them and in our government. Uh, so I'm hoping that when uh, ethics comes up that uh, you'll, you'll look at that closely and uh, provide additional funding. Uh, second, uh, this has been a year of many emergencies. Uh, and uh, there have been fires, Las Vegas in school, shootings even today, the threat of terrorism and even of nuclear attack, and the inevitabil inevitability of an earthquake. Here are my questions. Will the city enhance the city alert system and highly publicize how to sign up? Most people don't even know an alert system exists. Will city departments work together to address these concerns? Uh, in our white paper, we made suggestions that include studies to possibly revise building codes, burying power lines, mailing announcements in DWP bills to sign up for the little known emergency alerts, working with federal, state, county, and other cities to remove dead trees in close proximity to the city, and enhancing ex existing emergency management department programs. I think this is essential to the safety of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Jack, back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of some of our thoughts with regards to the budget. And I think the first thing is, is that we've reviewed this budget uh, quite a bit, and again, we have serious concerns that the budget really isn't balanced. Rather, it is an, an, an exercise in trying to, uh, to hide the fact that the city is engaged in intergenerational theft, Shh. that the city is dumping billions of do dollars of liabilities on the next two generations of Angelenos. The proposed budget does not take into account the, for the raises for the civilian workers, which we have been told will be about $40 million. 
The budget relies on a transfer of $17 million from the reserve fund. That's a rainy day fund. And when our revenues are up $340 million and the, and the seven significant revenues are up over a couple hundred, I don't think that's adequate, you know, justify, justifies rating the reserve fund. The budget also relies on 80, 80, taking $85 million from the budget stabilization fund. And when that fund was approved in 2011, the idea was to build the fund, not to divert the revenues into ordinary da daily expenses to maintain our streets, our roads, and our, 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 our streets, our roads, our sidewalks. Um, we also have the uh, street damage restoration fee of $62 million. From my perspective, that's just another raid on the Department of Water and Power because, quite frankly, they think they do a better job of fixing the streets after they've torn them up than, the, than, than, the city, than street services does. We also talked about raiding the, the Special Parking Revenue Fund, again, for $32 million bucks. And then we have the issues, Mr. Krikorian's favorite thing about the, the, li the city's liabilities, uh, is $89 million going to be enough or th even throwing in the unappropriated balance going to be enough given that every day you pick up the paper, it seems like we're getting nailed for, you know, millions of dollars for whatever it is. From my perspective, if you look at these uh, expenditures and eliminate the questionable sources of revenues, we got a budget deficit of more than $200 million. The budget outlook, I think, is cooked. I think it's totally unreliable. Uh, over the next four years, we're projecting total deficit of $77 million, including a $100 million surplus in the fourth year. Um, but if you factor in the raises for the civilian workers, the police, and the firefighters over the next four years, the budget gap goes from negative $77 million to over a billion, oh, no, to $980 million, call it a billion dollars for, from round numbers. And then this, this budget doesn't take into account the monies that we need to repair our streets and the rest of our infrastructure. And that's probably another two or $300 million. I know Buscott, Joe and um, Mitch have, have done quite a bit of work on the on the streets. Uh, I think your number was 250 or something like that. And, you know, the city hasn't done anything despite having record revenues. It also doesn't include enough money from my perspective uh, with regards to the pension plans. And if you, you know, if, and if you and if you look at uh, if you take people like Warren Buffett or Wilshire Associates and some of the people that are uh, pretty knowledgeable in this, they'd say the p pension discount rate ought to be 6%. If that's the case, the, dis the deficit goes up to seven $15 billion, and that would cost the city about another $500 million a year. So I think, you know, when you look, look at the outlook, uh, you know, we're talking about a shortfall on realistic accounting of over $4 billion. Now, you would say, well, you know, you're smoking dope. Well, I'd be happy to share the, num you know, sh share the numbers with you. But, you know, so I, I think that there, there need, you know, my big pet peeve here is I think we need an Office of Transparency and Accountability. Uh, that was recommended, which you recommended, actually, Herb, in August, April of 14, um, that you thought that was an excellent idea. It hasn't even received a council file. Um, the, the, we, we say that the uh, controller and the CAO and the CLA are responsible for give, giving us good numbers. Well, these numbers, from my perspective, are completely faulty. If, if you were in corporate America, you'd be out of a job, if not in jail. So I, th I think we'd like... We, we, we'd like to have a little bit more transparency. We'd like to have monthly meetings. We'd like to set up, set up the Office of Transparency and Accountability, and we'd like to review in detail with you our 10 recommendations that we made this year. Although we had many, we tried to narrow it down to 10. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for all your service, and thank you for coming in to give us your point of view. And, Howard, I'll see you around. And, Joanne, I need another photo of uh, Spirit because I'm sure she's older than the one I have right up here on my desk. Anyway, thank you all so very much for your work. So now we'll get Mr. Kokorian, did you want to say anything, or can I go into comment, public comment? Or? Straight to public Ms. comment, please. No, okay. no, just, you can go straight to public comment. All right. So why don't we start with Mr. Herman, Mr. Prevlin, Previn, Mr. Dan Deckler. Please come forward. George uh, Bazalidi. Come forward. Okay, Mr. Previn. Thank you, sir. It's Eric Previn from CD2, and I, I'd like to thank the budget advocates. It is a little bit of a heartbreaker. They do work very hard. They're very smart. These are people who volunteer, and yet the description of the way the city has received their input is just heartbreaking because you could use it. You could use it. Uh, I really appreciate Mr. Humphreyville's contextualization of the real problems. And as regards to the liability, 
I mean, this is an endless cycle, and the city continues to push for ordinances and plans that result in more litigation. So, you know, we got away from the judgment obligation bonds, but it's a real serious problem. And I, I would ask you to waive the privilege and talk about the, the liability issues out in the open, and we'll watch the the liability will reduce in size. <clears throat> it's just unbearable. And the number of meetings where you give 30 seconds at the beginning of a meeting or a minute, that's not real common. You should list like agenda for any television program. When you're going to talk about it, the public who are on that item, say transportation, can come down and hit it at that time. It's just, it's just silly, and I really hope that you will take it seriously going forward because you can't keep moving the balls around forever and ever. Thank, Thank you. Dan Deckler, uh, Ms. Ramirez, George uh, Bazzidi. Sean, Ms. McAllister, yes, go ahead, Mr. Herman. Cautious and prudent overspending? Things are better when you got $10 million, but it's even more better when you got $2 million more to spend on nonsense, corruption, abuse, and waste. The same way Paul Krikorian under LLC Yasari and Asari, LLC, have abused our city because Mr. Kokorian doesn't have a bar license to practice law. Hypothetically, though, he get should on the subject, not I don't see how this assert to the any liability against the city because when you pay outside attorneys to deal with the budget, you're sure how fucking up the deficit. Next speaker. Next speaker, please. Thank you please very much. get a silence in the back. Yes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, clearly, as, as our previous speaker, Mr. Herman, spoke, we have a lot of waste and abuse in this city. Here, the Budget and Finance Committee, supposedly we're supposed to have the best minds here that, would, that, that could budget the finance in this city, and yet we are spending most of, if not all, our money here. All the revenue that is generated and brought into the city, it is now paying off all the lawsuits that are coming in in bulk piles into this city. How is that possible? And again, you're not able, able to provide adequate housing for the law-abiding citizens, and we're not even providing a, a budget to protect and serve the military veterans, as Gorsetti said he promised to do, which he failed to do. And uh, again, we're not doing anything to protect and provide uh, for the reasonable law-abiding citizens, but we're too busy subsidizing these goddamn fucking okay, wetbacks. Thank and get you. Back. Thank you. Next speaker. Yeah, I'm for this item. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, I'm for this item. Okay, next speaker, please identify yourself. Do I have Margaret uh, Malloy? Please you know me, come forward. Well, yes, George sir. Bizzetti, former director of policy, Congress of Racial Equality, California. And you remember Celeste King IV. You guys all helped make sure he died. Not one of you people here is accountable for nothing. I got your chief of police with felonies recorded, okay? I got your city attorney with felonies. You don't give me my exculpatory evidence, and you don't give me the budget so I can analyze it. You see those homeless people? I'm organizing them right now, and I'm going to teach them law and budget. We're going hey, to fix get your on, butt. on this subject, though. If you people can't get a hold of your money, maybe you should give me the budget because you've had a year. I take 15 minutes to analyze school district budgets, like Baltimore, not having any federal funding at 21 grand. They had money. You have money. You don't need to get fees for signs for this foolishness. You people are stupid and corrupt as hell. Thanks. Next speaker. Identify yourself. Patricia McAllister, teacher and an advocate to tear down this crooked city government here. Now, I have studied accounting at Chicago State University, graduated cum laude. Okay, now, I found in the budget, I have all four or five books, that you're giving the city attorney $128.9 million for salaries. Now, the gentleman mentioned earlier this unrestricted revenues. You're giving the city attorney an additional 158 million. So we're talking about about 300 million unaccounted for money. I believe that's where the scam is in this city. Money. This is what I believe based on my research. City attorney, homelessness, and the other area you all know about. 
you guys on this council taking all of this money throughout the year that's not budgeted, and, and I believe you're putting it in your pockets. We're going to do something about it. Thank you. Next speaker. I'd like to address inequity. In April 2012, GQ magazine named Abbott Kinney Boulevard in Venice the coolest block in America. In 2017, 2018, Westminster Elementary School at 1010 Abbott uh, Kinney Boulevard in Venice is a Title I LAUSD unified school. And, and Mr. President, I don't see how this relates to our budget. That's okay, under uh, please uh, relate it to the budget. Um, students. No, we'll relate this to the city's budget. That's the item, so go ahead. I'm telling you, it's called inequity. How, how, do, you, how do you proportionally share monies throughout the city? The richest, the hippest street in America has 86% low-income kids. We don't have bathrooms. We have 1,200 homeless people in Venice. We have one set of bathrooms open at night as an experiment. Okay, we don't you. have drinking water. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That, uh, that closes uh, the public hearing. The, the, uh... Now, Mr. Spindler, you can sit down. I don't have a card for you on this item. But here, I'll tell you what. Just come on up and get your minute. Okay. And let's uh, count that towards this time. <laughs> So we'd like to thank Paul Krikorian for his budget. <laughs> so what we have is we don't have enough money for a homeless. We don't have enough money for outside counsel. We don't have enough money for police overtime. And we don't have enough money to cover the Coster's deficit which Paul Koretz has been trying to reduce the rate of return for the pensions to 7%. He understands this. That's why he doesn't get a chance to talk. Instead, our favorite goat, Paul the Goat Krikorian, <laughs> he takes over the whole budget, and he just runs roughshod over it. Paul Krikorian, a man with a suspended bar card, Paul Krikorian, Stay on the, the dumb subject. asshole. Stay on the subject, okay. So uh, I'm going to close, uh, Mr. Clerk, the uh, uh, public hearing, public comment on this item, and we'll continue it uh, till uh, Monday, special meeting. That is correct, sir, uh, Monday at 9 a.m. Okay, let me get Mr. Murphy back up. 11, 12, items 11, 12, and 13. Mr. Herman, 11, 12, and 13. Come on up. 11, I'm against. 12, I'm for. 13, I'm against. Uh, Sean, why don't you take your general public comment as well? Yeah, general public comment. Uh... The sanitation needs to work harder about getting rid of these bulky items, the big bulky items. Like a, I saw a, bi a, a bed lying on the curb near Burbank and Laurel Canyon. They need to work harder. Thank you. Mr. Herman, uh, uh, and your name, sir? My name is, uh, my it, name is Eric Kupu, and I'm Your here. name is what? Eric Kupu, C-U-P-U-R. Uh, I did not call you, so you have to wait till I call your name, uh, uh, Eric, so I'm looking for Mr. Herman now on items 11, 12, 13. So he gets his two minutes in general public comment, and then if we could have Mr. Previn, 12, 13 in general public. Yes, sir. So what consideration of motion am I speaking about, Mr. Weezar? Or that to you, Mr. Kokorian? For relative to below the market value sale of one motorcycle at a budget deficit cost by the Los Angeles Police Department, who at this point is in litigation over a 50-year-old man raping a child, I find that the LAPD Museum is eligible not to purchase the motorcycle, 
but the city award the museum a surplus of $100,000 upon a free motorcycle, so this way the vehicle identification number matches a budget number, a real budget. And then I go into community, communication, ordinance of first consideration for established salaries at the new fucking world-class airport. You know why I call it the new fucking world-class airport? Because it deals with labor fucking relations, and I'm a labor advocate. Until every personnel at the L.A. airport, oh, I'm losing my voice, get what they deserve, $50 an hour. And I authorize that $50 an hour because you heard the budget is doing A-OK. -okay. And as long as we have Yasari and Asari LLC under Krikorian, we can never lose. We keep giving money to white niggers. Put the lights on. I pay the budget in this city. Put the goddamn lights on so we could hear what the budget's all about. Let's give him his minute. Mr. Herman, your minute for public comment. So... Back in the days when Herman Jason Wesson said that my public karma was offensive, is it offensive? You know what's offensive? I find Tony Cardenas' sexual misconduct offensive. I find the conduct of Jose Wezar inappropriate. I find the conduct of Nuri Martinez supporting sexual crimes against children. And after all, LAPD was on the news for fucking a child at their home. What the fuck is going on with society? Do you got no ethics and morals? Besides that, if you would just give Wayne Spindler a goddamn check, you get the motherfucker out of the city business. But as long as he's here, we're here, write us a blank check. So we can go support Homeless Thank Foundation. You. Thank Fuck you. Fuck you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is Mr. Previn here? Ms. McAllister, you'll be after Mr. Previn. You'll have uh, item 11 and then your general public comment. Mr. Previn, you can speak now on items 12 and 13. Sure. Are you not calling one? Is that just... Is Mr. That not... Previn, okay, you can that's speak fine. on items 12 and 13. I did sign up for it. Fair enough. So am I blowing all my time on the items you haven't called? Mr. Previn, you can speak on okay. items 12 and 13. 12 and 13, sure. The motorcycle donation to the LLC, sure. I have a little experience with that because we, um, we have some LLCs that come around and like to get donations from our local neighborhood council. And the Ethics Commission had talked about these LLCs. Uh, <clears throat> they raised the um, limit to $2 million. So it's got to be over $2 million for them to have to make the kinds of disclosures that other groups have. So it serves as a little buffer for council members to get things done, to pitch things to various. Here it's the police officers. We had a, recommend, a request from our Low North Hollywood PD pals group. They did a little money from this. So the city gives the LLC the money, and then the money is spent without any oversight. So, you know, the LLCs, there was a big article in the New York Times, so I know you read that one, about how this is a problem and people hide, especially in the real estate business. Uh, today in one of your items, you've got Sasson K. You're going after one of his LLCs. It's very uh, murky unless you have the time to bore in. And even then, sometimes you bump into a dead end. So I, I'm, I don't know what to say about that. I wish we could find a way to require LLCs who do business with the city to make disclosures, to make appropriate disclosures about who they are and what they're doing. Because otherwise, it's a kind of a laundromat feeling, which I don't think anybody is that excited about. Now, on your track maps, obviously, this is where the council districts, working with the BO, in a, arrange for a kind of mapping. Usually, it's to give a little piece of property or to zone it a certain way. Now, in our neighborhood, in CD2, as Blumenfield discusses with Cedillo, you know, we have uh, proposals, and I know you had a little rally, sir. It was very nice to see you and Mr. Westall as activistas, once again, back connecting to your roots out there on the street to make sure that we can put some places to help people in our communities. Now, the only problem was the outreach was not great. They just kind of announced it. Now, maybe the outreach follows the announcement, and we're going to get Mr. Krikorian to explain what he's thinking about, okay. because there's a lot of nervousness. Now, let's people give him his one minute for public comment. And Mr. Uh, 
Sure, I'd just like to echo, thank item you, Item one was continued, so that's why. Well, I appreciate why. the response, thank you. Not out of my time, but thank you. Um, you know, somebody, one of the speakers commented about uh, there's one restroom in all of Venice at night, and there's about hundreds of people on the street. I know Bonin is chasing, I think it's Weezar as the most, but, you know, it's not a civilized society, as Sadio will recall, to have a place where people can't take care of themselves, even in public. Now, today we have in Grand Park... Um, very big celebration going on uh, for the, I think it's market night or something, where everyone's going to gather around, have a cocktail, and they managed to find a way to put porta potties up. So it's very heartbreaking that we can't find a way. And I know we're trying. I went up to the 15th floor to a meeting inadvertently that was described by Meg Barkley, our homeless coordinator, as a private meeting about the $20 million to put up a tent somewhere. And I found that the, that tent that Mr. Garcetti is going to try to get going for $20 million and then the $10 million thrown on top for services. Not until January of 2019. I mean, what is this, like an art project? I think we have to think of it more like refugees. And I know that that's not fun because nobody wants to spend a lot of money, but we have to. Thank you. Ms. McAllister, you have item 11, so she gets one minute, then her general public comment. Yes, item 11 here, you want to, um, under the communications from the city administrative officer and the city attorney's office, you want to create a new position and uh, paid them $134,000. This is an airport labor relations advocate. Now, city attorney's office is named here, and whenever I see the city attorney doing something, they get some of that money. I want the city attorney's office investigated by the FBI. Not only, now, I went to visit the city attorney's office a while back because I was concerned about us losing our right to speak in here. And you know what they told me off the bat? I think we moved city attorney off item 11, Mr. President. Let's move, ease Excuse back on to item 11, Ms. McAllister. I am. It says city attorney, so if it's mentioned here, I can talk. The city attorney is in on trying to get this advocate. Now, I'm trying to explain something to you. Quit. Listen, city attorney, I'm not afraid of you lawyers. No, no, just stay on okay? the item, man. And he had no, no business interrupting me. Just stay on the, I'll stay get on on the item. I'll get on it right now. Okay. Stay on the item. Now, here's the deal. City attorney. No, wait, wait, wait. Now you have your general public right. comment. Give okay. her one moment. Gen okay. The city attorney's office, like I told you earlier, they want nearly $300 million. Now, how, guess how many people they hired? They say they have on staff 800, over 800 staff members in the city attorney's office. That is the, this, this, this budget was created by organized crime. Over 800 people. We only needed maybe about 100 lawyers in this city. You giving these crooks over $300 million and they giving the, the police 1.5 billion. We haven't had a riot since, since Rodney King. And you're not doing anything with immigration. What do the police need 1.5 billion? I visited the city attorney's office, and I asked them, why are we being denied? You know what they told me? We're not here to protect the people. We're here to protect each other. And I'm not lying. That's what she told me. I was speechless. She said, we're here to protect each other. And my job is to turn this city attorney's office out. Turn them out. Because they're the ones who are making the money, writing all these laws, and criminalizing Thank you. people. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. Uh, Mr. Spindler, you can come on up and speak on item 11 and 13. But before Mr. Sping Spindler speaks, let's vote on item 12. Madam Clerk, item 12, let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Give 14 Ms. eyes. Thank you, Mr. And Mr. President, yes. pardon me, there's been a request to send that item forthwith. Okay, so ordered. Mr. Spindler, 11 and 13. Okay, so item number 11 is the fucking airport labor relations advocate. Now we need $134,000 of blackmail money for this labor relations advocate. Because when you're working for labor relations, you don't talk like this. You talk like this. You see, you need an airport labor relations advocate, see? So whenever the labor gets out of town, you hire the appropriate people, you break a few kneecaps, and you get yourself the union in line with the world airports, and you need $134,000 of blackmail money to get it done. Herb Wesson, of course, understands being a chief mobster, you need 134300 cash, and you're going to fucking give it to them now. Now we get to the next mafia matter. 
13A, CD5, the Mafia wants 800 Detroit Street. They say no. You say yes. We say no. You say yes. The Mafia wins again. 13A gets approved. And again, we give a developer something they don't pay for. And then we get to 1513B in the 15th district. 8th Street, another scam. But that's because $11,800 for a $4 million entitlement goes to Joe Buscaino's buddies at WH San Pedro. And why are we going to give it to him? Because Joe Buscaino's writing out Janice onto the FBI. That's why. Congratulations. 13 Bs to the rat to the FBI. Let's give him his minute. So the one minute, of course, is dealing with the litigation against the city. They've been going into closed session. The chairman of the Budget and Finance Committee, the delegate for this chair to the claims board, is a suspended lawyer. Paul Martin Krikorian has lost his bar license and cannot legally practice law in the state of California. And that means Mike Fuhr is doing what? He's representing the employment of somebody suspended from the bar and failed to report this on a form to the state bar. So now the state bar, the FBI, the Department of Justice wants all of the minutes for the last three years of all the closed session items from the Budget and Finance Committee and the Claims Board. Let's have the transcripts. And let's see who's practicing law without a license. It's Paul Krikorian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's vote on items 11 and 12. I mean, 11 and 13. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 eyes. Okay, Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask that we reconsider item number 10 for purposes of consideration of Amendment 10A, which has been circulated. Okay, so uh, we'll vote on reconsideration. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Okay, now we'll vote on the, uh, the issue as amended. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 eyes. I guess that's not going to happen. That's it, probably, not. probably not. Mr. Majewski is in the back. Let's take some of our general public comment. Okay, let's go do that then. Lydia, I saw you earlier. And Matt uh, Tenoco. Good Welcome. morning. Lydia Ponce, Venice. Been waiting since I was a little girl for the beats and bits and pieces of history that I was taught to be glorious truth, specifically liberty and justice for all. As an indigenous person, I believe in sacred places, and my relatives in Venice need and require that you support the Westminster First Baptist Church preservation. Help us, I ask you, to preserve this as a building, historical building, as it was purchased and sold with fraud with one broker, and that is highly illegal. So what about a, a, an unhoused uh, dom, uh, dominance in the, the dehumanizing sweeps? I saw one on my way over here at Ralph's on Lincoln and California Avenue. I, I think those need to end if you're truly about, the, um, about helping unhoused. The business improvement districts continue to police and profile people. And let's roll back the neighborhood councils as they're a runaway local circus funded by $30,000 a year by you. And what about an anti-displacement commission to be real about stopping homelessness? Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Lydia. And if I could, I'm look, is Eric still here? Capel, Eric, so you, you're behind this gentleman. My clock. All right. You ready? All right. Uh, so good morning, LA City Council. My name is Matt Tinoco. Um, I'm here mostly because I'm scared. Uh, about a month ago, one of my friends named Frederick Rune Fraser was struck and killed by a hit-and-run driver on Manchester Avenue uh, in Mr. Paris Dawson's district. And then the next day, at a memorial vigil, another one of my friends, Trell Stallings, was struck and severely injured by another hit-and-run driver um, at the same intersection. 
Um, I'm sure there's videos, they're very graphic, they're very hard to watch, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, but the point that I want to make here today is that Manchester Avenue, uh, pursuant to the mobility plan, uh, is supposed to have a protected bike lane. Um, and had that protected bike lane been there as previous plans, as articulated by the city, by this body, um, maybe he would still be here today. Um, it's, it's hard. I'm, I'm a seasoned rider. I've ridden tens of thousands of miles on the streets, and I'm very hesitant now to do it more. And a lot Thank of us you. are feeling very scared these days. Thank you. If I can get Eric. So I think that the, some of the money that sh that's used on funding the police should be used on increasing patrols on Skid Row because people are still getting mugged, raped, gang raped, and a lot of nasty shit is happening down there. And nobody seems to give a fuck unless it's on their front door. Secondly, you guys need to arrest the corruption in uh, gateway cities. There's, there's police departments dedicated to selling drugs to the local communities and working with gang members. There's an efficient leaks in the system that need to come back that you guys need to create programs that encourage jobs that help the homeless, such as mental health professionals, professionals, et cetera. You need to make law some more accountable of how they waste their money. If you guys really care about homeless people, well, it doesn't look like it. And hempcrete, you guys should invest in more substantial alternative technology if you guys don't really want to waste that much money on basic, like, regular housing. Also, I never thought politics was this shitty. Okay. Eden Berrientos. Eden No Weiss. Danny Oder. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eden. I'm a local resident of South Los Angeles, and I'm here today on the behalf of my friend, Frederick Frazier, who was killed last month violently uh, by a car. He was a victim of a hit and run, a growing epidemic in our city, and it hasn't gotten enough attention from city officials, the public, and law enforcement. I urge you to put, to put your efforts and funding into lower income communities, such as South LA, to be a lot more bike friendly. We can do this by creating bike lanes on main streets, such as Manchester, where he, where he was struck, where it, it takes the support and commitment from both city officials and the community to save lives. A lot, a lot of people have, have lost their lives. We had enough, and I'm tired of being treated like roadkill. We, we have a boys. Please put more bike lanes in South LA. Like, people are dying. Thank you, sir. Mr. Weiss. Uh, Council, uh, since Mr. O'Farrell cannot see his way clear to uh, speak with me uh, in private, five minutes of his precious time, I want to address my concerns to the Council and to Mr. O'Farrell in public. Um, the uh, uh, matter concerns uh, a circumstance in Mr. O'Farrell's district where in the situation we had adjoining residential properties, one, a 1,600-square-foot residential house housing 18 people renting by the bed at between $450 and $500 a month. Next door, there was a duplex. The duplex was about 15 to 1,600 square feet. 15 people rented by the bed, obviously in violation of the zoning, but nobody is going to enforce that zoning because we would have more people on the street. Um, going forward, uh, the City Planning Commission was so concerned about the conditions. In fact, there was 31 cited violations. Uh, Mr. O'Farrell was written a letter on February 23rd to be continued at the next public comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, and I'll be looking for a Michael Haggerty, Carolina Goodman, Sean Meredith. Yes. Uh, hello, City Council. My name is Danny Oder. I'm from the 10th Council District. Um, I'm here simply to say that I want to thank you for your support of bicycling infrastructure. I recognize that it is hodgepodge. As a cyclist, I find it hodgepodge, and I know it deters people at the same time that it also encourages them to bike. And I, and I want to say that this situation is the same thing that I've seen over my lifetime with recycling, with organic food, with solar panels. It takes 30 years for this kind of thing to become mainstream. We're in it for the long haul as bicycle advocates, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Next speaker, please. And um, Mike Greenspan, if you're... Could make your way down. Yes, sir. Identify yourself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Haggerty. Um, members of the City Council, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I am an attorney at Kids in Need of Defense. Uh, I represent undocumented children as they fight to stay in the United States. 
However, I am not here to speak about that. I'm here to speak about the epidemic of traffic violence in our city. Um, I'm asking the leader, I'm sorry, I'm asking the, the city council for leadership in addressing the lack of safety on the streets of our city. Uh, people are quite literally dying on our streets, and this is unacceptable. As an Angelino who bikes, who walks, and who drives, I fear that I or someone I love will also one day die due to the lack of safe bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure in Los Angeles and the culture of traffic violence that pervades our city. Our lives are in your hands. We need protected bike lanes. We need safe crosswalks. We need to slow vehicle speeds. We need meaningful commitment to Vision Zero, not just lip service. Our lives are not accept or, excuse me. Our lives are not an acceptable cost to maintain the status quo. Thank Please you, make our sir. streets safe. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm also looking for Miss Richardson. Are you still here, Jacqueline? Uh, Spencer Higgins and Matt uh, Matt Stewart. Yes, sir. Identify yourself. Hello, my name is Sean Meredith. Um, you know, people should be able to get to a school, work, or wherever they're going without dying or feeling constantly threatened. Um, biking and walking should be safe for people of all abilities and ages, not just for the best fit bikers out there who are able to keep themselves alive somehow. Um, our car culture is dangerous, and the safety deniers who are trampling over anyone to keep the status quo of car dominance, they're a threat to the future of our city and our world. In Los Angeles, pedestrians and cyclists are involved in 14% of traffic collisions, but account for 51% of the fatalities. Hundreds of lives are lost every year, and hundreds of families are shattered by these tragic outcomes. Livable streets create things we really want in the city, things you guys want. Livable streets, protected bike lanes. So families who want safe streets are demanding courage and leadership from our city council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meredith. Uh, next speaker, and maybe if Ted Rogers, if you're somewhere around, you can get in line. Please identify yourself. Good morning, President Wesson and council members. My name is Carolina Goodman. I am from the League of Women Voters, Los Angeles. Welcome. Given the importance of the decision to name the new chief of the Los Angeles Police Department, we asked each of the finalists to respond to questions particularly relevant to immigration, as well as questions regarding their main intended priorities and areas for reform. This morning, we will be emailing those responses to Mayor Garcetti with copies to all of you and hope that if you are on the hiring committee, you would take the time before the interviews to read what the three finalists wrote. We appreciate that the candidates have recognized that more must be done to reform LAPD's policies with regard to immigration. LAPD policy still facilitates the deportation of city residents who pose no public threat to safety. Thank you. Thank you, and I have copies of their... Sergeants, can you please get... She has car copies. Thank you. Our next speaker, please come and identify yourself, sir. Mike Greenspan. Mazel tov to Jewish Heritage Month. However, you forgot one aspect of Jewish heritage, the country club. Not the Jewish Country Club, no. I'm talking about the places like Tim Tebow's Tim Aquana Country Club in Jokesonville. It has no Jews. Fucking Baptist in the Klan, fucking Baptist in the Klan, the white collar Klan, of course. Even Jesus Christ would get rejected for membership at Tim Tebow's Tim Aquana Country Club because he's Jewish. I'm sorry, Mr. Christ. We only have Christian members at Tim Aquana Country Club. If we push the envelope, our belly belly own, belly belly own, Hobby Wesson for a second Schwasser to join Tim Tebow's Tim Aquana Country Club. You just have to teach the fucking Baptist in the Klan what a Schwasser is. All right, that's, di that's different. <laughs> Ms. Richardson? Because of a large number of shootings in neighborhoods, I was asked to ask this body, also LAPD, if they would get fingerprints of all current officers and all future current officers. 
because uh, people, many people in black neighborhoods and other neighborhoods have been shot without provocation in their black neighborhood, I was asked to ask you and uh, this body in LAPD if they would get fingerprint checks of all officers, current and future, to have their fingerprints done from Moscow, Russia. This could be done very easily and quickly because it's automated. If this check is done, and it's done within seconds, it could possibly uh, eliminate all unprovoked, many or all unprovoked shootings in the black neighborhoods. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Next speaker, please come and identify yourself. This is, this is Matt Stewart, a transportation engineer. Um, I'm here to speak about the continuous killing of cyclists on the roads of Los Angeles. In 100 years, I truly believe we will look back and see people driving around in single occupant vehicles, 3,000 pound killing machines, as the craziest thing that ever happened in the past. The technology for autonomous vehicles is coming, and it will help, hopefully, prevent cycling deaths. But there is technology already today uh, that can transport people throughout the city in a much more efficient way than these huge vehicles, and that's bikes, scooters, what have you. And we need safe infrastructure. And I humbly ask that you please view us as a reasonable mean mode of transportation and support how we get around Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking for, is it, are you Mr. Higgins? Rogers. Okay, so you're Ted Rogers. I'm yes. still looking for uh, Spencer... Sims, Tamara, Case, Tiffany, Fagosa, and please wait till I call your name, Ms. Malloy. Yes. Okay, I'm Ted Rogers. Uh, I have some letters for the council, if someone could take these for me. Uh, Sergeant. Thank you. Their name, but uh, all the same. Uh, a lot of us came out here today uh, to speak for bicyclists and pedestrians because we are, quite frankly, scared to death. Uh, we risk our lives every time we ride a bike. Every time I walk my dog along the street, uh, I'm in danger from cars turning in front of me while I'm on the sidewalk. Uh, so we've, this council has made commitments to Vision Zero and to building out the bike plan and yet failed to follow through on these things. And frankly, I'm very tired of putting up ghost bikes. Uh, we're tired of losing our friends. Uh, we beg you. Uh, you'll see in these packets a book and a CD, a CD, a DVD. I'm sorry. We beg you, you to have the courage Thank to you. do the right thing. Thank you. Next speaker, please come forward, sir, and identify yourself. Hello, my name is. Is this on? Okay. Yes. My name is Spencer Sims. Um, I'm a, a cyclist, or at least was a cyclist. I used to bike about 160 miles a week. Um, but I got hit by a car. I'm wearing a knee brace right, right now. I got hit by a car, hit and run. The guy took off and just, and just drove off and things like that. And wound, uh, Frederick died on Manchester Boulevard. I live in Inglewood. This is in my neighborhood. Now I have to ride a motorcycle. This is my 10th day riding on a motorcycle. But guess what? We just need to just focus on South LA. We need to focus on building out that bike lane there. People are dying, people are hurt, people are scared. They're scared to go outside, they're scared to walk their dogs, they're scared to ride a bike, which you guys here know about the benefits of bicycle riding. So please focus, please do whatever you can. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Sp next speaker, please identify yourself. Hi, good day, Council. My name is Tamara Case. Thank you for having us here today. I'd like to honor the fact we are here on Tongva and Chumash land, our ancestors. We're all visitors here on this land. Council, today I would like to address the fact that we have a housing emergency. This is actually a crisis and not something that can be dealt with in five to ten years. We need housing now. I'm here to speak on behalf of those voices that are, can't be heard or can't show up here today. There's a war here on poverty. 
We're building housing for big developers, expensive housing, and the only certain class of people can afford and pushing people out. Well, yet, still no affordable housing. Along with the war on poverty and making poverty a crime is a disproportionate violence of killing people of color and giving the money to the police state. Thank you. Next speaker, and if I can get Margaret now, I'm calling you Malloy. And is there Susanna Sheck? Please come get behind Miss Malloy. And you are in the... You are... Oh, yes, Tiffany, yes. Um, I'm standing before you all as something of an anomaly because I am an Angelino. I was born in a hospital named for a saint overlooking um, a river named for Lady Queen of the Angels, and I have never had a car. Um, I get around by other means. Um, there's a completely fictional statistic that says that there are um, 1% of bicyclists will, who will ride anywhere, any hour, any road, any time, and of that tiny percentage, 1% is female. I am that female. Um, my commute takes me through numbered streets at night, not first, second, third street, through the hundreds at night, and I'm brave enough to do that. Um, I don't worry so much about myself, but I do worry about my friends because I'm a traffic safety advocate, and I have to follow court cases as you make me through courts all the way to the end where I listen to victim impact statements presented to the judge, and I'm scared that my friends will have to do that for me someday. I don't want them to go through that ever, ever. Our streets must be safe for everyone who uses them. Fatalities are not a tolerable byproduct of transportation. Loss of life and severe injuries resulting from traffic crashes are unacceptable outcomes that we can address. And these are not my words. These are Mayor Garcetti's. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malloy. Hello. I'd like to talk to you about your initiative today, Save a Life. Thank you for starting that. We need it desperately, but we need equity in how people are treated in the city. Uh, we will be sending you documents this weekend which we're begging you to review, to asking you to de-establish the Venice Beach bid. It is just fundamentally flawed. Um, they collected $1.7 million in 2017, produced no services, and laughed, literally laughed, while they attempted to create a motion on a refund. It's not a laughing matter. $1.7 million when we don't have clean drinking water or bathrooms or shelter or anything for our homeless people. So I'm asking you, please read this document that's coming your way. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Ramirez, if you could come and line up. And it, is George still here, Baziti? Then, George, you're back in line. Yes, ma'am. My name is Susanna Schick. I'm a resident of Los Angeles, cyclist, motorcyclist, pedestrian. We live in the law of the jungle right now. Before Garcetti took office, we had a mayor who had a vision and who was willing to work with LACBC to make our streets safer and to create more affordable housing. Our streets will not be safer until we enact um, a congestion charge, which I did the math, and we could have made enough money to fund our metro for, for all the money they were trying to raise in 2014 if we just added $20 a month to parking for commuters who come downtown. We cannot do anything about pedestrian and bicycle safety until we make it more expensive to drive a car, particularly for people who can afford other means. For people who absolutely have to drive, there can be concessions. And the thing is, that will never, it's like we are in a dangerous city. I have PTSD from, you know, having all my bones shattered in the Spring Street bike lane. I need to be in a safe city. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ramirez, did Spencer Higgins, did you come forward? Okay, yes, Ms. Ramirez. Thank you. Stop the middle class homelessness and poverty holocaust by these corrupted L.A. city officials and take down all the homeless tents down on Spring Street and Main Street from Cesar Chavez Avenue to First Street. Take down the tents down also at El Pueblo Park where all the fucking ugly, filthy, nasty, violent, racist, hate-mongering, chango, Latino wetbacks and gang-banging pigs, thieves, and pussies hang out and divide all the stolen property from the innocent homeless law-abiding citizens and our beloved United States military veterans. You will find 
all of it hidden in their tents. These violent, ugly, homeless changos and changas and junkies and pimps and homeless mothers. Again, eventually, we're going to have racial riots, and they're going to start killing off the Mara Salvatrucha, the Mexican Mafia, Hazard, 18th Street, Norteños, Sureños, the fucking FBI, the fucking CIA, and the fucking NSA. They're going to start killing them off, and that is what the people are saying on the streets. They're going to kill the gangbangers and their families like they did with Pablo Escobar when, the, when they killed them off. They're going to kill them all Thank down. You. Thank God. you. George, George. No, come on, Miss Ramirez. You got to be respectful to the next speaker. Okay, George, floor is yours. Damn, maybe you should have some respect, fools. How about your chief of police going into prison? Go to fraudbuster.org, fools. You got the emails multiple times over the last three years. 5915, I came in here and told you people that your chief was committing felonies by erasing the audio of the police commission meeting. PC 132, Hobbs Act, Rico! And you've cleaned the web of all your three guys up now. Sorry, no new chief of police. George, George, George keep it down. No, Go ahead. It's about time, you fools. Get me by a substantial evidence. What's the name of your city attorney here? Because if you don't have it to me by the end of the day, not only Rezar's bar license is gone, your city attorney's bar license is gone, and Jackie, Lacey, and Mike Fuhr are going to prison for what they're doing to me. You're trying to send me to Division 95 to protect you assholes. You go look at the perjury by LA Unified on thank, you fools. Thank you, George. Thank oh, you. Yeah. That jo George, George, your time is up. All right, your time is up. Your time is up. Your time is up. You're, dis you're disrupting the meeting now. Just chill out. All right, so I'm looking for Spencer Higgins. Uh, Mr. Stewart, Matt, you already spoke, right? Who, uh, is there any other public comment speakers? Would you guys come on up? Yes, ma'am, identify yourself. I can't hear you. Tell us I'm your name. Uh, Chaplain Ruth Summers Tweedle and my husband, Chaplain Ravel Tweedle. And we thank you for giving us the time to speak. Um, we had brought information about Honor Thy Father to you previously, and we have some additional information, but we also have a program that we're working on for homelessness and creating um, lower-income homes, and we wanted to just leave that information with you guys because women, we, we do our feeding programs and things on the street uh, from Silver Lake to East L.A. to all the way to Santa Monica to West L.A., all kinds of things. We do that on Thursdays all day long. They haven't had a chance to change clothes since Thursday. But in the meantime, what takes place is there are women and children that are being raped on the streets and their belongings being taken and some men are being taken advantage of too but if we have more lower income homes which we can build three two houses for like sixty five thousand dollars within an apartment complexes with as many as 18 people in there for 225 we just want you guys to know what we can do through the churches that we work with and then that way you guys can do that and please look at honor thy father because there's some wonderful men thank in you. all the world and thank we're you Thank you. Thank you both. Sir, in your name, did you want to speak? C come forward. You want to? Go ahead. Hi, everybody. This is a great day. I'm going to invite everybody out to the party at the Prowl Bird. My wife has a beautiful advertised material, so come out to the honor of that father. June 17th affair. Denise Estelle has been doing this for 17 years, and I was told that the uh, Mr. Lewis Gossage in the Office of the Gentleman was the recipient last year. And her. This year is Carson, so uh, I guess this year, and I went to a meeting in South Central, Mr. Brad Carson will be honored, but you know everybody needs to be honored here. So, thank you. May God bless us. Thank God you. Bless thank you. Uh, hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Honorable President, City Council, uh, thank you for your time and your service. Um, my name is Mark Torres, and I was... Um, 
I'm, I'm here today to talk about our children's safety in our public schools, in our um, military academies, and also our military institutes. Um, it's come to my attention when I was trying to make my uh, photography website that there's these things called top level domains because .com has run out of combinations of numbers and letters for a domain to create a website. So they chose a bunch of words. And there's a company that purchased .school, .institute, and .academy. For example, Roosevelt High School, Belmont High School, um, Wilshire's Private School. Uh, all these schools are, can be purchased for $40 online from GoDaddy. And then for five more dollars, they could get the email that can generate um, any staff. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Now that ends general public comment. Mr. Herman, you do it again, or Mr. Spindler, you'll be removed. Okay, let's uh, recess and go into the special, Mr. Clerk. Very good, sir. Item 14 uh, is an item for which a public hearing has been held. Okay, let's Blumen prepare. I'm sorry, sir. Blumenfield, Bonner, Bruce, Gainos, Sadio, Linder, Harris, Dawson, Wizar, Chris, Cochran, Martinez, Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Rue, Wesson, 12 members present. Thank you. Let's prepare to vote on 14. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 eyes. All right. Mr. President, that brings us to items 15 and 16. There are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, they're now before this body. So let's get Mr. Previn come forward. Mr. Previn. Fifteen and sixteen. Thank you. So we're in the special meeting now, obviously. And uh, item fifteen is the sale of the city-owned properties. We read about uh, your exciting packaging together for the convention center, two giant towers that are going to be three-star properties. I understand hotels, so we can get up to speed and compete with Las Vegas for various tourism convention business now. You know, we have today, for example, you brought out on the lawn the Unite Here people, the hotel workers, and, you know, there are some jobs that come with these, these visits and stuff. But the question of is this the way forward for our city to be giving huge credits to hotel developers, as we do uh, in the past, you know, we have to be fair to everybody, but we're fair to everybody who happens to be a big hotel developer, not the, the taxpayers who then underwrite it. We find ourselves hearing Jack Comfortville talk about our real budgetary concerns, uh, you know, once you look beneath the veneer that Krikorian has painted in. So it's upsetting. It is a little bit upsetting because I don't know why, um, you know, I don't understand how a giant tower full of people in... Why are we competing with Las Vegas? I mean, is that what we want this place to be, Los Angeles? This is a wonderful, vibrant community with so many wonderful things to do. I don't know that adding more hotel rooms and cutting a great deal for those folks is the way forward. Now, Prop K is item 16. This, this is, uh, K does not stand for Krikorian, as I've said before, and it doesn't stand for uh, Wesson World either. But you guys are great at taking these propositions, including HHH, and finding ways to move the money around without having proper meetings or nobody knows what's going on. Now, here it looks like you're taking $3 million from one of the Algin Sutton. It's a pool, I believe, in uh, Mr. The Marquise Harris Dawson's district. You're moving three million from this fund to that fund to the. But are you redoing the pool? Is a, is a question. When I first read, it, it looks like I'm not even sure you are. You should be, and you shouldn't be taking extra money and putting it in Studio City, where they're going to put like something that looks like an airport on our little park. And that's what we've been talking about. Uh, but we can't talk about it into a microphone or to people around because you hide the meetings and you don't have the meetings and you Thank plant you. the commission. Thank you, well, Mr. Previn. Sean, uh, is there James Pugh? James Pugh, you after Sean. Yeah, Mr. President, I am six. I am fifteen. I'm supporting. I am sixteen. I'm supporting too. Thank you, Sean. Mr. Pugh, followed by George, if he's here, and uh, Mr. Uh, Herman. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, honorable council members. Thank you for the city's hard work to bring item fifteen to a final decision today. I'm Jim Pugh from Shepherd Mullen, representing the applicant on this item. 
We've worked hard to bring it to this point and look forward to a positive vote. So we're respectfully requesting that you approve that item today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Herman, Mr. Spindler, please come forward. Are you going to start missing your time? Miss Ramirez, start coming forward. Uh, 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 my understanding on item of surplus property. No, no, no. Let's go to the one on the item about Proposition K for cunt assessment funds. Since the cunts aligned Sutton Pool Project has authorized council cunts as part of the Proposition K for cunts. No, you're, you're off the topic, Mr. Herman. We're talking about No, no, come on. Just stay on it one more time and then you can sit down. Now, to eliminate overcommitment of funding, Three million is an excessive amount for Proposition K interest monies in replacement for source of funds. Although this committee has authorized it despite public comment, because as you read, no impact submitted, so I find that the necessary technical corrections should amend and reflect public comment. That's item 16. Now, on item 15, regarding surplus property, such as for HHH, we find that city-owned properties shouldn't be given to Beverly developers, I mean, I'm sorry, developers in interest of a NPV, other words, MVP, for the city and Lightstone, Lidgestone, DTLA, fuck your LLC, to provide as conditional obligations. The same way, during the budget comment, I said, fuck Paul Kokorian. Okay, Ms. Ramirez, uh, and let me, is there Scott Randers? Scott Randers, Ms. Ramirez, go ahead. Thank you. With all the city-owned properties, we can build just enough uh, homes to to basically deter the homeless crisis. That's what we should be using and not making or developing hotels. Now, again, the hotel business is nothing more than racketeering where they hire all these fucking wetbacks and gangbangers to rummage and steal all your ID. Get on the subject. So having said that, again, use the city-owned properties to to deter homelessness. House our military veterans first and foremost, and then house our legal law-abiding citizens, and then deport the other motherfucking and wetbacks and gangbangers. Okay, thank, thank you, Ms. Rem- Ms. Ramirez, thank you. you. Your time's Trump. expired. Okay, George, let's see. George, come on. And you know you have to stay on the subject, George. You're all, you have one item. Man, I'm more on the subject than you fools ever been. What are you talking about? I know these issues better than you do. I eliminated your office of public safety because you didn't do your damn job, fools. And you're trying to put me and in the funny And we are car. off topic, Mr. Already, President. George, you're off. Already, George, you're off topic, brother. Your time's expired. Sergeant, show him the way to the seat. No, you're, you're, you are not, George. Go sit down. You are not. You got to respect other people that are here. Go sit down. You are not. A, you're not even close. Go on and sit down. Spindler, wh- come on. Come on. Stay on the subject. He's disrupting the meeting, Mr. City Attorney. He is. And he's shouting. In fact, we leaves. should uh, let's show him the way out, Sergeant, and and let him stay out there. Sp- Mr. Spindler. Mr. Spindler, stay on topic. The, the floor is yours. No, have him removed. Mr. Herman, do you want to leave too? Because you're disrupting this meeting. Spindler, go ahead. I don't want to break his microphone. 
Yes, I mean, this is such a heated de- hotel development incentives. It's getting so violent at HDIE. Oh, my God. We have to give land surplus property to the developer. If we don't give it to the developer, we'll all be shot. So the hotel development must be granted, or we will be shot. So please, I was against Lightstone, but as you can see, Lightstone will have all of us killed unless they get this land. And they're going to kill all of us, so please just give them the fucking land. Even though it's worth $67 million, I say give it to them for a dollar like the motorcycle because it's hopeless. We just don't want to be hurt anymore. We're sorry, Lightstone. We're sorry for offending you, Lightstone. We love you, Lightstone. Please, Lightstone. I know you put a bomb under his car. We're sorry, Lightstone. So please give them the hotel development and send them. Give them whatever they want. We surrender. Even the FBI knows that Lightstone has to get this money. They have to get this free land. And we know that Herb Wesson is afraid too. And that's why he's, he's afraid of Lightstone. I'm afraid of Lightstone. But he can't get a TRO against Lightstone. They're too powerful. Now you're off the subject, Mr. Spindler. So, Go ahead. Fourth construction and number 16. It's the proposition cunt K mid year country programming report. Give them what they want. Hands up. Don't okay. shoot. I'm sorry. Thank you. So that concludes general public comment. Uh, let's prepare to vote on the remaining items, which I believe are 15 and 16. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Okay, we can adjourn this, I believe, Mr. Clerk, return to the regular. Yes, sir. And these two, all of these, these items, let's go forth with. Now, if we could return to the regular meeting. Very good, sir. What's before this body? Mr. President, Council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted. They are referred. Uh, announcements, members. Um, Let's all rise for adjourning motions. And members, just as a reminder, Monday morning, 9 a.m., let's be here on time so we can get started. So uh, adjourning motions, I'm looking to my left. I don't see any to my left. I'm looking to my right. Don't see any to my right. Members, again, don't forget Monday at 9, this meeting's adjourned.